So I'll start off with this one. Um, I read this. This one's just off your Wikipedia, but I read that um, you started stand up on the advice of a restaurant coworker. Is that true? Yes. Um, what was the first experience like on stage? Like, how did that work? It was great. It was. I was surprised. I thought it was going to be terrible because I'm not like a. I'm not like an outgoing. I'm like a. Na I'm not like a class clown naturally, outgoing person. So, but this one waitress. Uh, she said, you're funny. You should try stand up. And then another waitress went, used to go to this comedy club and she goes, she goes, me, yeah, me and my boyfriend go out there. It was in like near the airport in, uh, near, in, in Chicago, near O'Hare. Hmm. And so, uh, so, uh, and then I, and then there was another guy who worked there and he, I used to joke around with, him. he was a bartender and he was like kind of a hippie bartender. So I said, yeah, I got to, his name was David Gelman. So I said, I got to talk to you about something. He goes, what about how you want to be a stand-up comic? And I was like, what? Because I never, I had mentioned, I hadn't said it to anybody. Right. I mean, I, I had a, like this woman said, you should be a stand-up comic. I, I wasn't like, yeah, I'm going to try stand-up comic. I never, I never said to anybody I was going to try stand-up comic, not to my family, not to anybody. So the fact that he said that, I was like, wow, that must be some kind of sign from God that I got to do it. <laughs> And then, uh, yeah. and then I did it, and it was it, like I thought I was I was really nervous, and not really nervous, but I just I, I thought I was just going to be because you 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 never I've never done it, so I just I went up and I grabbed the mic and I started talking, and I wasn't I was calm, like I was surprised at how calm I was, you know. So interesting, and, and it always kind of even now, like I'll get in a situation where I'm like, oh, this is going to be nerve wracking, and like even now with the break, we haven't done stand up. <clears throat> you know, I didn't do stand up from like March until October. And then I had a show in, yeah, I hadn't done any shows. So I was weird. And then I, Louis CK brought me down to Baltimore. Hmm. And like, and I was, I was like, well, how is this going to go? And I just kind of went back to like, I'm like, well, the first time he did it, you didn't know what the fuck was going on. So, so this should be okay. But, but then you got, you know, the, basically a full house. As, as full capacity as they could get and you know and, and i'm opening for louis so i can't yeah. like just choke on my own dick or anything but <laughs> but uh, i was nervous i was like i, I like i remember that sitting in a hotel i'm like what the f like i was trying to remember my jokes and so it went fine but you still get a lot of anxiety and then you get up there and you know I, i'm i'm usually just fine I'm, i have i might have a lot of anxiety going up but then i'm fine once i grab the mic and start talking well it's a big one to to get back into you know supporting louis ck um yeah that's, yeah that's, that's what i mean weird. so i there was a little pressure that with that and i think louis is just like i don't give a fuck what you do and also he probably figures i mean i he didn't ask me when's the last time i did stand up i think maybe mm -hmm. i said it in the car on the way down but louis wasn't like well you better do good you know yeah well i mean he had joe list opening for him so i don't think he really cares that much about how good people are. <laughs> That's just a joke on Joe List. But um, you better take you better take that part out. They're gonna they're gonna Joe they're gonna come after me. Oh yeah, the, all the Joe, Joe List's fans. <laughs> the Joe the Joe Listers. That's what he should call them. His yeah. fans, the Joe Listers. All four of them. Yeah. No, he's got a piece. I just looked at his stupid uh, YouTube thing. His, his, his the special he put out was like, like three million or something. So wow. he must. He must have some fans. Even Louis, like it's it's just so ridiculous. I, I was thought Louis was saying about he went to see when Joe List did the special. Mm. Uh, he taped it at the Village Underground at this you know near the cellar, and uh, so he was talking about the first show versus the second show. I think Louis went to the second show, and he goes, "Yeah, the second show." Uh, he said Joe told me the second show wasn't as good as the first show. And Louis didn't see the first show, but but uh, Louis goes, yeah, I guess the first show he filled the place with his, I don't know, his podcast fans. Mm. Like he just, it's so dismissive because <laughs> Louis just fills stadiums. I like, I don't know where Joe List gets his fans. I don't know if they're his stupid podcast fans or, and I was just, I don't even say anything because I'm like, yeah, that's how people get fans now through their fucking stupid podcasts, you know. <laughs> Um, but it's just so funny because Louis friends with the guy and he still has to disrespect him. Like, I don't know where he gets his stupid fans from anyway. <laughs> uh, yeah, just moving on. Um, so you were famously beaten by a then 19 year old Dave Chappelle at Star Search in 93, only for him to project your brother Neil to future stardom. Was that a bit of a p bitter pill to, uh, to swallow? 
No, because I don't even, I, the timeline was just, it, it wasn't, listen, I'm going to go off topic here because it's, it had nothing to do with Dave Chappelle. I, that was probably 92. I was actually thinking, because when I did my podcast yesterday, uh, somebody had made a joke about, about, uh, Neil and it was basically the same timeline, but it was like 91 or 92. I know it was a 93. So it was 91 or 92. Neil would have been uh, 19. So he was already probably friends with Chappelle. And, uh, and I, I swear to God, I'm on everything that I never thought I got to, I got to pair up with Dave Chappelle. Like I knew he was good. He was very good, but I just never thought that way. Like, uh, like even when Ray Romano got a sitcom, uh, my manager was like, why don't you talk to Ray? You know, cause I was friends mm -hmm. with Ray. She goes, why don't you talk to Ray about getting a writing job? And then so, and he, and he got paid when he got, after he got picked up for the second season, I, I think I call him cause I don't think we even had fucking emails then. I know we mm -hmm. didn't, but so uh, I said, Ray, can I get a job writing for you? And he's like, you don't want to do that. Do you? And I go, not really, you know? <laughs> so, uh, so you never really, you never really think of like, I got to fucking package myself. But Neil was a mm. doorman. Like Neil was, uh, Neil was a doorman at the fucking Boston comedy club. So mm. of course he's going to see that as a golden opportunity to be friends with Chappelle. And again, they were the same age. So when we were, when I did star search, uh, I, my girlfriend at the time, we were about to, we were about to move. And, um, I told a story of my podcast, but we were, but we were moving. And if I won, uh, I was going to stay over. I was going to stay in Disney World till the following Monday, and so and so then I wouldn't be able to help her move. So I had I had gigantic incentive to win. <laughs> so I beat I I beat uh what's that guy's name Harlan Harlan William I beat Harlan Williams, hmm. in in my first round his he had he was the returning champion I beat him, so then I I knew how, I had a go up against Dave Chappelle. I didn't care. I, I just wanted to not help her move, you know? Mm. So I call and we were living together. So I was helping myself move, but then she was going to, she was going to have to, when I, so basically if I won, I would come back and the move would be done. And, <laughs> and I would be like, uh, it was a win, win if I won. <laughs> so I won, I won. And then I call, I go, good news, bad news. I, you know, I won the first round of, uh, and then, and then, but the bad news is like, I, we're not going to be able to move. And she goes, Oh, the moves put off because the electric won't be done in to the apartment mm -hmm. until next week. So we got to move next week. And I was like, yeah, exactly. A typical. <laughs> so, so I never thought for a second, Oh, I got a Dave Chappelle and Neil. I never thought, I literally never thought for a second. I just, mm -hmm. and then, and they were the same age and I was like 10 years older than them. So, so I, I just didn't care. I never I never thought about hanging out with Dave Chappelle or, or trying to buddy up with him. Fair enough. Um, what can, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it sounds like bullshit, but it's 100% no, no, true. I, 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 I should take I a lie detector it. for this stuff. No, I can, I can believe it. I think that... As, no, I as mean, a, I was friends with Dave Attell. Dave Attell was f like the funniest guy. So right. it's like I didn't need to ha be hanging out with Dave Chappelle and Dave Attell. Like, it's like let Neil take Dave Chappelle and... Mm. and you know, it's like I, I, I never was think I was never thinking like I guess I didn't I didn't I didn't um look at my career in the right way. I was always, you know, maybe if I had a family or something, but at this point I was just trying to get good as at stand up comedy yeah. and maybe yeah. get laid once in a while, you know. I think that kind of attitude as well, it it's more the opportunist types that that, that sort of look towards the comedic industry of, of who can I attach myself to and who right. who is on that trajectory to success that I can right. sort of you know and that doesn't strike me as as you at all to be fair I wish it, I wish I could it would yeah you'd be probably in a much better position but it no of course I would yeah I don't even know how to do it I don't even know how to do it I was I was trying to I wanted to have sex with my wife last night she ended up kicking me out of the, the bedroom because it was like oh I just don't know how to approach people when I want something from them you know <laughs> Well, we won't go th too far down those weeds, but um, yeah, we don't want to. <laughs> what can you tell me about the? Uh, I mean, I don't even know if this is true, but uh, apparently there's an NBC pilot script for for a show called The Brennans that you and Neil perhaps were. Again, I don't know if that's true. It's just something I, I sort of read on a napkin somewhere. Well, we did a couple of pi we did a pilot. Um, yeah, that, that was NBC. Yeah, we did a we sold a pilot. Um, to NBC, wait, what? Which was it? Um, oh 
shit. Well, we I sold two pilots to NBC. One, one. No, no, no. I no. You're right. I'm trying to get this straight. Wait. Mm. The the yeah the the we made a pilot. We 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 did a table read for for NBC in like the late '90s, and um, but that was just a table read. So yeah, that was nothing. Mm. The, the, we made in 2004, 2005. I got a development deal with HBO and they stay, and then we sold it to NBC. So I, I don't even know if it had a, I guess I had a working title called the Brennans. Mm. And, um, and then we made the pilot didn't get picked up, but Neil wasn't involved with it very much. Neil was more involved with the uh, other, um, the pilots that I made in that I sold in 98 and 99. Neil was, right. Neil had just done half baked. So, Mm. They were, you know, and Neil would just show up at the meetings like, you know, he's slumming at a TV. Which... <laughs> By the way, with he- with Half Baked, I've um, in preparation for this, I've re- I read some of your credits and I saw that you were you you were had a little scene in uh, Half Baked. I've watched it about two or three times through now, just skipping through, trying to find out where you were. And yeah, I'm, I'm not, kind of... I got I got cut out. Oh, okay. Well, they well, so I watched Half Baked twice for no reason. <laughs> No, Neil, actually, I think Neil called me. I joked that Neil sent me a Shit Happens t-shirt, but I think Neil called me. Again, I don't know how, any, how anybody did. I don't even remember, what I, but back then you had to call people. So he called me and told me, you know, I was cut out. I, again, I didn't, I mean, I was probably like, I probably thought it was funny or something, maybe like half funny, half half like the half depressing. Cause, but I didn't care because I was I just went up to right when that when that all that was happening, I was getting a lot of TV action. Like I was I was right. working, yeah. at, I was doing a warm up at Spin City, so I was like meeting like Michael J. Fox, and and then mm. I was getting then I was getting like more TV stuff. I was selling TV pilots like me and Neil, Neil sold two. And there's SNL as well on top of that. Yeah. Then I, so, yeah. So it was all during a thing where I didn't care. Like it, looking back, people are like, you know, Jim, I just saw Jim Brewer who was in half big, very mm. prominent role in half baked. And yeah. he, he was telling the story, uh, because, uh, when I, I was only up there for like in Toronto for like a day or two, mm. And then I was, but I was hanging out with Brewer a lot. And then, um, and Brewer had like a studio or a, or a trailer. And so we were just hanging out on the trailer. I think he was getting high a lot, but it was half baked, you know, so they couldn't really yeah. get mad. <laughs> and so, uh, but I just remember he was like, I, I remember telling my girlfriend at the time, I go, Brewer, Brewer laughs at everything I say, you know? So I don't know if because he was high, but he, he was laughing. Like, I like this guy because I didn't really hung out with him that much because he was always like on TV or whatever. So he was yeah, not, yeah. he was not in the clubs that much. He was more on TV. So but I remember thinking like, this guy's all right. He, he thinks everything I say is funny, but I don't know if it's because he was high or whatever. But anyway, he's telling the story. Uh, I saw him at and at a club, Stress Factory in, in New Brunswick, New Jersey recently. And uh, so I brought him up on stage and he was telling the audience the story about um, about how um, I got pissed because I got cut out of the movie because when the half fake came out, mm. um, everyone was like, "Oh, what's great? It's so funny!" And Neil's so great, and he he pretended he was me. He was like, "Fuck Neil! He cut me out of the movie. He's my own brother. What the hell?" You know. So, <laughs> so the crowd laughed because it was you know it's it's a funny story. But really, when Neil told me, I didn't care because it was a small part. Of course, and it was just—it would have just been a blip anyway. It wasn't like I had a serious thing that they cut me out of, you know. And I got paid anyway. And then it looks, and then I'm in the credits. And uh, one guy came to a show one time in Austin, and or he called the front 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 office, or he called the box office, and he's like, uh, "Who who was he in Half Baked?" And I I told him, "Tell them I was a uh, Jim Brewer or something like Harlem <laughs> Harlem Williams." <laughs> I was Jim Brewer playing the other character. Yeah, just say how say how he played the Jim Brewer character or yeah. whatever. But you know, so people were like, "Yeah, they're like, well, who who was he? I did, I watched the movie. I don't remember him." For a while, I thought you were the guy lying on the couch, and I was wincing at the screens. So that's not Kevin. <laughs> yeah, that's uh, that's what you call it. What's his name? He's a famous uh, deadpan comic from Boston. Oh. Um, but yeah, What's speaking now, of him, um... now I'm flipping out. What's his name? God damn it. Oh God, we'll, my memory! We'll I gotta take that Prevagen or whatever that, that helps your memory. <laughs> yeah, I'm struggling myself uh, recently, but yeah, just on the uh, subject of SNL. Um, so you quit writing for SNL, uh, I, I believe, because no, uh, I didn't quit. 
I didn't quit. That's in my wiki. That's, that's somebody, on your wiki, yeah. Yeah, but somebody, that's not really what happened okay. was I didn't, I got fired. Wow. So when it says on my Wikipedia, I quit. I was like, yeah, that's all right, motherfuckers. I quit. I didn't quit. Mm. No, it's a good job. It's a good writing job. But what yeah, happened was I was, I was yeah, because it's like you get paid even when they do reruns. You get basically get, you get paid it's every, cool. every forever, yeah. Yeah, but you get basically, I remember I would get rerun checks and it was basically just as much as the regular checks, the show checks. Mm. So, um, yeah, because your wiki, your wiki says that it was um, because the uh, Colin Quinn's anchor position, um, which you uh, went in for for a couple of, of, of the episodes, was handed to Tina Fey and Jimmy Fallon. And I was, I was going to ask that, I mean, this was a really booming time for the show and literally everybody involved in SNL at the time went on to have incredible careers. So... Yeah, for me, there was a bit of a question in there of, of why would you leave? Well, you know, it, like it really an easy gig. Yeah, no, it actually was not that it was not booming then. It was, you know, what happened was that, um, you know, like it was between Norm. When Norm left, Colin got the job. Mm. So. Uh, so then they. Uh, so this is so weird. I don't even I don't even know how to even go into this. But anyway, uh uh Colin got <laughs> I can't even <laughs> this is like <laughs> I don't even know anyway I'll try to just spit it out because it's 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 a lot of moving parts anyway uh my I've told this story a million times but it's it's a long story the basically the the shortened version is that um they hired me to write for weekend update because uh they and they and I had to lie about my age when I auditioned. They sent a, they sent it was just it was a lot of shit. But they sent a tape of me, and then they liked the tape, and then so I auditioned live, and then then I had a dish. Then I, I they liked that. Then I auditioned. Then I auditioned in front of Lauren and his his buddies at NBC, and then the next day they said um, they said okay they want you to come to the studio. Hmm to do some to do like to do to audition for them at the studio i was like to do what i go i don't do characters so i was basically auditioning to be like a regular uh character a regular cast member on the show so i was mm -hmm. like i'm like i'm like what i don't even i was just i was just it was like a goof like yeah <laughs> you're like you want to you want to submit a tape to us and i go yeah why not because i was actually uh, I saw Colin probably that spring at Caroline's and he, and Nick DePaulo said, Brennan should write jokes for you. So I was already writing some jokes for him. I didn't get anything on. So I was already kind of like, I was, I was like, I was already SNL adjacent cause mm -hmm. I knew Colin and whatever. So he didn't use my jokes, nothing really happened. But then in the summer, you know, they, my manager's like, you want to submit a tape to SNL? I go, yeah, why not? Who cares? You know? So yeah. then they liked it. They liked my audition. They liked my second audition. Then they wanted me to come to the studio. And I was like, oh, Jesus. I go, what? I don't do characters. Like, like it was almost like a prank gone bad. You know, it's like, <laughs> I'm not, a, I'm not fucking Chris Farley. Like, I don't even, I barely do myself well, you know? So <laughs> now I'm supposed to do characters for Lauren Michaels in a studio with no audience. I'm just supposed to go into my, my Christopher Walken. Like, I don't do anything. <laughs> Kevin Brennan as Christopher Walken. Yeah, I don't do anything. I I can I can't even do Neil. Like I I can't I can't do any characters. I can't like I didn't know. So I told my manager I go tell because this was totally out of blue. This they contacted me in the afternoon. I mm -hmm. said tell him I'm at the airport going to a gig. I said I tell him I'll come back, but I'm not I'm not I'm not uh I'm not uh, like I'll tell him I'll come back and do it if they want but i'm at the right. airport I, i'm going to gig which i which is a complete lie i just made it up you know but i'm like i'm not going to the studio I, like i'll drag my ass in like fucking oscar in in uh in in uh oscar madison in what's that show oscar and felix anyway uh you're not american no, so i was about to <laughs> no i gotta idea. look up all the, sh the odd couple i got i'll drag my shit mm. like the odd couple and uh, like schlep my bags to SNL to 30 Rock and do some characters. I'll do a fucking Oscar Madison. <laughs> but so they said, they said, forget it. They said, forget it. You know, they don't need to see you. But I was, right. I was on auditioning, like whatever. It was just bizarre. But they, but that's like jump through hoops. Like 
Oh, c- come here. They want you to do this. Now, now, now stand on one foot and hop, you know? Yeah. It's so, uh, so, um, so then, so then we were like, okay, well, what? So then, then I had to meet with Lauren, go to his office and meet. So then I, then the, and my managers, I said, well, cause they kept asking me how old I was. Cause I was supposed to be under 35. Hmm. They kept asking how old I was. And my manager didn't say, I, oh, he's 33. My manager, like an idiot goes, he's dating an 18 year old. And I'm like, oh my God, <laughs> I, this is, this has got to be a joke. But she, I said, what if, what if I go to the meeting and, um, and, uh, uh, Lauren asked me how old I am. She goes, I'll never ask you that. It'd be so rude. His literal first question. How old are you? Oh dear. So my, so I have to lie to him. He, I said, yeah, I'm 35. Cause I knew that was the cutoff age. Mm. Like when a cop pulls you over, you know, how fast yeah. you're going, I was going 65. <laughs> it's going exactly 65. That's officer. a speed limit. Yeah. So I knew I was supposed to be 35. So I said, I'm 35. So he goes, you've been doing stand up, uh, for, for how long? I said 10 years. He said, so you started when, when you are 25. We're like doing math together. Yeah. He's working out. He, he probably so knows he, your age. He's probably. No, he didn't. Cause there was no Wikipedia then. And oh, they, they right, didn't yeah. really have like any way to check, you know? So, so, uh, so yeah. So, so he's like, so you've been doing it 10 years and you're, I'm 35 and I started at 25. I'm like, yeah, the math works. So, so are we mm. going to hire me or not? <laughs> anyway, we met for a pretty long time. I left the meeting. I was like, oh, that's fucking weird. It's just weird to meet the guy. And then you're like, mm. then, then like, did he like me or whatever? So then they, I got hired, you know, but I got hired. Oh, I think Lauren in the meeting said, um, you know, we probably have too many cast members. So would you be interested in being in working as a writer? Like we work, we, we can update as a, you know, writer for week. And I said, yeah, it would be great. So that's why they hired me. And then, and then they also kept saying, but I was supposed to do update pieces. So they were like, okay. And they were, nobody really pushed me to do update pieces, but then it was just, it was a lot of unspoken shit, you know, like, mm. and then, and then I wasn't getting, it's just a lot of shit. Anyway. So the, at the end of the year, um, the last piece I did wasn't very good. Like I misread the line. So I, st- I, I like, I stumbled on words and I was watching, like when I watch the news, I watch the news a lot now, especially with the pandemic. Like sometimes the newscasters like, like fuck up the words and you mm. never care you no, never no. care but in comedy you care like in comedy if they flub, they flub the words they're like what the hell's going on but they yeah. do it all the time on the news so so anyway so so uh and then and then but i and also i heard that after my last thing that you know i might not be brought back that was like the rumor colin told me because there's a rumor going around that they might not bring you back because you know mm. so i had so i met with lauren lauren goes like the last week of the show, Lauren goes, well, yeah, we're going to bring you back. Cut to me not coming back. <laughs> so, but they also, they also got rid of everybody. Like they cut Colin. Yeah. Uh, they, did. they cut Colin. They put me on, they put me on, uh, on a hold. So they put me on a hold. So they let me audition for to get update. Mm. Um, so Tina and, and Jimmy audition. And there was like Jeff Ross and me and, and, um, some other what's the i forget his name anyway jake johansson jake johansson uh audition he was friends with the producer or something so he auditioned there was like five people auditioned mm. and i knew tina and fucking jimmy was gonna get it because they already worked there you know right right yeah they were so so then they got it and then i was let go as a as a writer and or or performer you know um yeah just moving on um so you f- you had your first appearance on Opie and Jim in 2015, in which you exposed fellow comedians, and it drew a lot of uh, acclaim, especially from sort of former o- Opie and Anthony fans. Um, is that something you've been consciously tapping uh, into since? Obviously, you, you 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 podcasts since then have been very much in the same kind of ilk as as your first appearance on Opie and Jim, or is that just the real Kevin that we're just seeing? Um, hold on, God damn it. I'm looking. Fuck, he's still not listed. Oh wait, hold on. I gotta, I gotta see this. <laughs> Stephen Wright. Stephen Wright is the comic from. Oh. Uh, yeah, yeah. Who's who's who plays the guy on the couch? Yeah, he's on. The, yeah, yeah. I've I've heard. So it. yeah, because that was driving me crazy. <laughs> um, no, you know what happened? You know, you know what's so funny is like, you know, people show the clips of me on SNL or clips of Letterman. It was like. 
the thing is i was not i was not really i know it sounds like gay i don't know if you can say that on the sh- documentary no, but I say, like, I say gay it's uh like i wasn't i, I wasn't like I, that wasn't my strengths you know like like the reason i got fired from snl right or the reason i wasn't going to do well at snl is because i don't really smile you know i'm like i'm not a smiley kind of a person so you know and i was like if i did a, a letterman or whatever like those shows are you know they want the they want like the the slick kind of commercial comic more mm-hmm. than they want me you know yeah. so so i was a little always a little frustrated like if i got on tv i was always like you know i should smile like even i would say like smile more and fucking be more friendly but it wasn't really it wasn't really my sweet spot but mm. this was my sweet spot like when i got because i i knew that a little bit because i used to uh, when brewer had his show with pete corielli on uh, on sirius satellite radio uh a lot of times brewer wouldn't go because he had to drive in from new jersey and he just he just didn't want to do it so i would fill in a lot and i was it was good because it was long form radio and you could curse and you wouldn't have to worry about they wouldn't have to constantly go to commercials like most like you know in the old days when you do a radio uh when you do radio in the morning to plug your show it was just you know they wanted somebody like mark norman you know like like real like a one-liner guy like yeah. kind of upbeat and you know got a nice haircut you know so when i did when i did brewer and uh um p corelli's show i just i was like i was like yeah i'm i'm better at this than than the short shortened version of doing radio so but the opie thing was was caught me a little bit by uh off guard was like how well received it was i mean mm. I, I was kind of like the whole week the whole week after i did that, i was like oh this is fucking great then i was like and then i was mad at myself i'm like you should have tried to get on earlier because now I know how fucking Patrice, because I, I remember I would go to like clubs and they'd be like, yeah, Patrice sold the club, sold out last week. And I was like, what? That fat fuck sold Because <laughs> I, I, didn't, I didn't realize like you could get so many fans from doing radio, especially mm-hmm. if it was an O&A and, you know, and, and I'm doing Opie and Jimmy and it's not even probably as probably as popular. I mean, it was still popular, obviously, but it probably wasn't as popular as, when when they were all there together and i was like so i feel like i missed the boat but it did but but once it happened i didn't give a shit because i was like this is fun as shit Mm. to just say whatever you want and the fans like it and i like it like and also it's just like i feel like it just keeps like i don't run out of material like i used to with Mm. stand-up like with stand-up you're like you know you, you you you're stuck with you know you have to appeal to the audience like you have to appeal to women it has to be like hit a real you have to like kind of thread the needle with mm. jokes yeah. and stand up where this, I just, ha- I just be myself, be it, be talk a lot and fucking be an asshole. And the fans <laughs> are like, this is, this is refreshing. And I think, you know, even now I've been bitching lately about Bobby Kelly and, you know, I put a negative comment in his Patreon and he took it out <laughs> and it's like, that's sad. And I think, you know, not to say I'm a throwback, but I think I'm like to, to, to the O and a fans. I'm like more, of like how it used to be than it is now, you know, where everyone's trying, everyone's PC and everyone's afraid to get, they're going to get canceled or, you know, don't say this, don't say that. So I think, you know, I'm, I'm not, I'm not saying that's, that was my plan. I had no plan. I just, mm. I remember when I went in that day, I said, just be aggressive. It's nine o'clock. They've been on for at least two hours. Probably. I think they went at that point seven to 11. So mm. I'm like, they're already bored just go in there. I took a five hour energy and I'm like, just, just, just go in there and be, be aggressive, you know? And that's what mm-hmm. I did. So when there was ever like dead airtime, I was fucking talk. And then I think, I think Opie, I think they both appreciate it. Cause it's like, they probably loved it to, that the, a guest would just come in there and be, and not just sit around and just like, you know, shoot the shit, like right, have, right. A, have an agenda at least, or have at least have some talking points, you know? exactly and that and then florentine well. florentine was the one who said when we were when he was on actually florentine coincidentally was on both of my first two episodes there and but i remember after the first one we we're taking the elevator down and he goes man the fans are gonna fucking eat that up he goes that i said it wasn't too much he goes oh my god they're gonna love it you're shitting on neil you're sh- oh god they're gonna fucking go nuts mm. and he was right my twitter was like it was like my phone almost jumped out of my hand my my twitter because i had no twitter presence at the time and my Hmm. twitter was just literally all day long tweets tweet like people thought it was a fake that i was shitting on neil they thought it was like a work and i was like i don't even know what a work is 
<laughs> that's how that's how naive I was to radio yeah. and all the fucking shenanigans. Well, yeah, I remember um, you talking about the the fact that you text Neil um, right after it, saying I said some things about you, <laughs> just as a warning or something. Yeah, I said I threw you under the bus a little bit. I, I said I'm just trying to sell some tickets in New Jersey. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that was true. I was I don't want to be boring, yeah. so I'm like I'm trying to say, and I you know whatever one thing. Like, plus, when you when you're shit on people, it's just it's it's fun because it's like no mm. one stops you, and then you know people are listening to it, so it's exactly, kind of like yeah. It's just, it's fun. Now I know why people loved O and A, and why people mm. loved going on O and A. You know. Yeah, I mean, I mean, that's where I come from—the sort of O and A universe, um, right? From the subreddit, and um, you know, all of the, you, you know, it was, it was, it was a moment in comedy time that was kind of frozen. That was, I mean, compared to what we have now, it's like you said, it was a throwback. It was something that uh, uh, is it's dearly missed. I would definitely say, but that feeds on to another question. Um, quite neatly actually i um you recorded your half hour comedy uh, central presents in about 2005 i believe and i think it was to a crowd of mostly op and anthony fans um because you're doing it at the, at the same time as jim norton uh, right you, you also appeared on colin quinn's tough crowd around the same time as well which was obviously around <coughs> that same kind of universe of the this comedy seller group um why so why didn't we see enough of you on op and anthony or, or why didn't we see you um involving yourself in that was it something at the time that you just wasn't aware of or was it something that you no i'm no just i'm in? stupid uh that was that was basically my fault because what happened was i was the last one i think i was supposed to, i think uh what happened was i got the eight at the half hour i think because hedberg was supposed to get it but he was in he was in bad shape so because the guy who i knew who, who was uh at hbo said he told me um told me uh they gave out all the half hours and i i was i was not sh i can't remember how you know worried about it i was he go and i was like all right you know i didn't know because mm. i just won like the best comic yeah, at yeah. the at aspen or something so so then i was like okay and then like a day later two days later he goes oh you know what um they're gonna offer you a, the special and i think he mentioned because of hedberg or something mm. i mean hedberg I guess died soon after that, but right. I didn't. I didn't know anything about it that he was in bad shape. I just thought he was like not doing well, you know. Mm. So, um, so I got the special, and then we, and then everyone said, "Don't compare with Jim Norton because they paired you." There was ten comics, I think. Then everyone got paired, mm. and then you would share an audience, and then they would, and you do two shows, but you would share, you would share the audience with another comic. So they would every audience would see two two comics. And so they said, uh, they said, everyone said, just don't compare with uh, Norton's audience because the O and A fans will be r brutal on you. So, uh, and then I did the show, and then the fans were great. And I said, I w actually Norton went on after me, so I I went up to his dressing room. I said, you know, the fans are great. Thanks for because he had said something on the show. You know, said, mm. said don't I'm doing a Kevin Brennan and don't interrupt them. I didn't hear it, but he somebody told me. So then I thanked him, and then, but as I think, even before Norton started his ep, his show, um, I went into the green. There was like a green room where you know friends and family could you know grab a soda or whatever. Mm -hmm. Everybody had the dressing room, but there there was this green room. So I go into the green room. I'm in between shows. I don't think Norton had started his, so there was nothing on a monitor to watch. So I see Opie there, but I don't really know Opie. So instead of saying, hey, Opie, how's it going, Opie? Mm -hmm. I just kind of play like, hey, man, I just like, oh, he should say something to me. Because I, <laughs> <laughs> I just went on. Like, you know what I mean? Like, I'm yeah. so stupid. Instead of like, I just, I guess I didn't know how big they were. Because again, I, I didn't listen to them because I didn't have a car. I lived in a city. Right. I didn't have a, I knew they were like a thing, but I didn't know how big they were. And, and I didn't, like, I didn't listen to them on a reader because I didn't have a car. And I just, you don't. You don't have a car, you know. You don't listen to the fucking radio that much, and I listen mostly listen to sports talk anyway, because I'm a fucking moron. So, so instead of just going, "Hey, Opie," uh, you know, "Hey, it's come Kevin Brennan," he would have been like, "Oh, great," you know. He, what's he gonna say? He's gonna mm. say, "Great set, you should come on the show." And then, and then somebody said, uh, of, "I remember somebody, a comic, gave me a ride home." after I did the taping and he said, Opie and Anthony were talking about me on the show. They said, 
oh yeah and jim did great and he did a, did the show with kevin brennan who, who was really funny but um and they, they the woman said you know you should try to get on the show I was like, I go, I got a TV pilot. I think I was more like TV. I, mm. I thought I was more like going to be a TV guy or yeah. whatever. I'm just, I'm a moron. If I had known anyway, but, um, and then the tough crowd thing, like, you know, I worked with Colin at SNL. And so it, we, we didn't, it wasn't like we didn't not get a, we didn't not get along, but like, it, I wasn't like tight with him. So the, uh, the tough crowd was all like the guys who were tight with him more mm. And also, I I, did, I remember I did, I, I remember I did a show like sometimes they do practice shows before they're they're gonna before they start the new season or whatever. So they brought me in for a practice show, and then I guess I thought, and then Keith Rob, I remember Keith Robinson, uh, Keith Robinson said, "Welcome to the team," and I don't I don't I don't know if I did another show after. That. <laughs> So I was like, what the fuck's going on? So when they got canceled, I was like, good. <laughs> Fuck them. They're not going to use me. I yeah. hope they get canceled. I, I'm, uh, tr- I'm still, trying to, I'm still trying to get, I'm still trying to get SNL canceled. <laughs> yeah. Good luck with that. But I just asked because it, it, it seems like a vehicle that was. I know. It, it, I know. It, Looking if, back, I should have played my. Had aligned, it, it, no, it I should. I should have been more like. It's like again. This. It, it's like I'm not. I'm like socially, but that I remember particular in particular. Opie was like. I was like. Opie should have said something to me. I just went on. He should have been like good show. I mean, I knew who he was because he would come to the comedy cellar one time sometimes and watch, mm-hmm. you know, comics downstairs. He would sit in the back. So it was, it, but it was, but it was just me. It's like the same reason I don't fucking talk to women. I'm like, I got to fucking beg, you know, it's like, <laughs> it's like, I mean, my wife, I met through another comic, the, the girl from before, you know, it's like, mm-hmm. I, I'm not, I'm not the best at like, Hey, you want to go out with me? Like, I'm like, fuck you. You're, you think you're better than me? You know, it's just, it's, it's, I have dementia early set on dementia. It started it's in probably- 2000 some part related to the fact that you had to compete with nine other children growing up and I don't know, but it's like, I don't like bit. asking people. I don't like, I don't like asking women on dates. I, I just think it's like degrading. So the fact that like the fact that I have to like do a show and now I have to say to Opie, Hey Opie, Hey, it's me. I, the guy was just on stage. Like, so I, I thought like it was Opie. <laughs> Opie should have been like, whatever. Even when I did over the Opie and Jim the first time, hmm. Um, Opie goes, yeah, you've never been on the show. I go, yeah, well, it's, you know, it's really my fault, but it, it was kind of my fault, but they never asked me to be on, you know? So I said, well, it's my fault. You know, I, sh- I never asked and I ha- I never did ask. I never asked and they never asked me. Hmm. So even after I did the thing with, Op- with Jim on, in the HBO half hour, they didn't ask me. So I was like, I, I, my, you know, it's not a healthy attitude. I wouldn't, I wouldn't w- wish it on my worst enemy, yeah. except for Lenny. Except for Lenny, well, it must McCarthy. be it must be difficult to to know at the time when something is you know if if something's going to have a legacy. You know, it's very difficult at the, at the time to really sort of you know know. The yeah, but I should have. I should have like anybody else would have done it. Anybody else would have been like, hey, Opie, because I knew well, who yeah. he was. I mean, you I have just, comedians I... like Bill Burr and Lucy Kay and and, and even Patrice who were they, they would you know claw at the chance to get get on an opian uh sorry an opian anthony um show it was it was very much kind of like that uh no elite. that's what i'm saying that's what i should have been i should have reached out i should have reached out and done it and when i did reach out i was like you know i was i was i, I was i wasn't desperate but i was like mm. you know i should try to get on these fucking i mean <laughs> i just remember thinking like uh, when I finally did reach out, my I like my act was really good at the time. I just mm-hmm. had a lot of new jokes. I was separated from my wife, so I didn't have to get my wife's permission to fucking. She didn't know what I was doing. That was right, partly right. what made the show as good was because I was kind of on edge, you know, mm-hmm. like like I was I wasn't living with my family. I could do whatever I want. I was drinking more. I was like, I was like, I just come from California, so I was better for them at that point because I had more of a story than like I right. You know, when I shit on everybody, I just moved back from California. I was separated from my wife, uh, you know, and I was drinking. I was like, I was, I was kind of like a throwback because I would never kind of lived that life where I was like, I did whatever the fuck I wanted, but I was at the time. So, and then when I was shitting on everybody, you know, I wouldn't have had that story 
back then because I was just like another New York comic where now I'm like a New York comic who just lived in LA and now I'm moving back here and I'm like, fuck LA. And I'm just, you know, I didn't care what happened because I was never going to go back there. So I didn't care what they thought about me, you know? Yeah. So it was a good time. I basically, as I said, I had a, at that point, I had a story to tell because before mm. that I was just another guy from yeah. New York. Exactly. You, you were and I always... wasn't as interesting as Patrice or Voss or, or, because I just wasn't, you know, I wasn't a crackhead like Voss. I wasn't a big fat uh, black guy like Patrice. But they, were, but <laughs> plus like they were all, <laughs> they were all Norton's friends, you know. So that's yeah. that's that's of course who you're going to bring into the studio, you know. I guess I just heard an episode where Pat- uh, Voss brought in Patrice the first time at O and A, you know. So yeah, I think that was the episode with the, the all the dildos and stuff. I think maybe. <laughs> I guess, but I like I wasn't again. I I wasn't following, but but now it makes sense. Like you know, I know uh, Norton and Voss were tight, and then Voss probably was like, you know, you guys should meet Patrice because Patrice was funny, and he was a Patrice was a character. You know, he was mm. just he was he had a lot of shit to say, and he was a character, so he's he's great for that show. You know. Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, moving on to um, to MLC. Um, so it was Bob Kelly's idea to partner you up with Lenny Marcus. Um, how aware of Lenny's comedic work were you, and what were your initial thoughts on being paired with him? <laughs> <laughs> Bit of a loaded question, but I, I just—I mean, the, I mean, everybody says the same thing. When you do, when you, your voice is so professional that when just to hear <laughs> uh, hear people talk about MLC and Lenny <laughs> and Bobby <laughs> Kelly with the professional style voice, it's like it's a just, BBC it's, report on Lenny. Yeah, Marcus. it's hilarious. Like even the Matter East thing, it's just like it, it's just it's it gives us so much more gravitas. Mm. If that's the right word because of the voice, because of the, the 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 accent or whatever. But it's not even right. an accent. It's just it's, it sounds like the BBC, you know. So whatever. <laughs> anyway, so to answer your question, is um. No, it was weird because again, I was still separated from my wife, and then um, and then I just done a couple. Uh, I just done my first opium and uh, my first opium gym, and then um, and then uh, Vinny Brand, who runs the Stress Factory, he he th- that morning he had called me said we should do a podcast together. And I was like, oh okay, but Vinny just always wants to do stuff, and there he never follows through, and then. Bobby Kelly called me that same day and I thought this is weird. Bobby Kelly called me the same day and he said, well, you know, I want you to do a podcast with Lenny. And I, I thought that, and I knew that podcast would be better because Vinny's, uh, you know, Vinny's done my show a bunch of times and he doesn't say anything. He's just very, cause he's a natural politician. Mm. So I just knew it wouldn't be good. And Vinny's always late for everything. So, so I just thought, well, Bobby's more connected with the, the podcast world, the O and a world. And so, so, and I, me and Lenny were friends. So, okay. and me and Lenny never had a, you know, Lenny, a lot of times would agree with what I would say. So we never had a, we never had a crossword as they say. And um, so, <laughs> so I don't know. I mean, it, but it, but it just, I didn't know Lenny. Like I, I didn't know Bobby. I didn't know any of these guys because I didn't really do any, I didn't really, I wasn't a bit like I knew a tell, I knew some guys, but I didn't hang out with a lot of guys and I wasn't really in business with, I, I really didn't do any business with them. I mm. mean, as a comic, you don't do a lot of business with a lot of people, you know, like if you have a development deal that usually get it by yourself. Mm-hmm. So they don't, they don't necessarily pair you with another guy where you have to deal with another guy's, you know, eccentricities. So, so it was just right off the bat. It was like off the bat, it was great. And Lenny was great because he, you know, he just laughed at all the crazy shit and how angry I was mm-hmm. and, and, and then, but then after a while, then to, once it started to get popular, then it was just like, wow, so this is what happens when it gets popular. Like people just, they can't just go like, let's just keep doing it how we're doing it. And, and it was, it was, it was, it was not depressing. Cause like I said, I kept getting content out of it and I, I didn't, I didn't really care that. I mean, I care, but I, I mean, it wasn't like a sitcom where or a pilot where a pilot like if things start to go bad you're you get kind of panicky because you're like you think you're not going to get picked up mm-hmm. or the the showrunner's going to quit or all kinds of stuff but with this it didn't matter because it was just a podcast it was like a breathing living thing that would just kind of keep evolving and that's kind of what happened but right at the beginning Lenny and Bobby were just 
I was like, well, you guys are dumb. You guys are fucking dumb. You know, <laughs> like, like Opie wanted us to come in and do like a show for him. And, and cause he had that network where he would do Voss and, and uh, a couple of other shows on his network. And then uh, I said, yeah, Opie wants this. I go, that's, this is great. And, and Lenny goes, we already have a contract with Riotcast. I'm like, what? I go, they're not, <laughs> I go, <Pain> you. <laughs> yeah, they're paying us zero dollars. So that doesn't even, it doesn't make sense, you know? <laughs> so um, I said, they're paying us zero dollars. And Lenny goes, well, I'm loyal. He basically implied, I don't know if he said these words, but he said, I'm loyal to Bobby because mm. I'm like, come on, Lenny. Uh, so it, and then after that, it became, it became like pulling teeth, you know, for anything. Just is like no cooperation. And I don't know if it hurt the show, but it was just, it got to a point where like we didn't, I, I wouldn't even, I wouldn't even, if he was walking, like from, if I saw him walking near the comedy cellar, I would like avoid Lenny just because I, I didn't want to get into a fight with him or whatever. So it's, and I remember that was in the summer. So that was, that was not, we started in January. So like within three or four months, it was already like, it was already like, this, this is a fucking disaster. You know? <laughs> I mean, you pointed towards uh, Lenny performing at JCC's, working a side job and refusing to go on the road as reasons for him not being a real comedian. Do you think that Lenny has the stomach for full-time comedy? What do you mean, a stomach for full-time comedy? Well, Lenny likes to consider himself as a full-time comedian. As oh, to be like a like to, to, to deal with the grind, you mean? Yeah, it seems, I think you put it, that he, he seems like he's got one foot in the industry and um, he's very scared or conscious about taking risks or, or about doing stuff out of his comfort zone. Um, so I just wanted a, a little insight on Lenny as a person, really. Like, what do you, what do you think he wants from comedy? <laughs> um, what does Lenny want from comedy? Um, I think, listen, there's a lot of different, there's a lot of different people in comedy. So, so, you know, before I did comedy, I would watch Letterman, I would watch the Tonight Show, and I'd be like, "Oh, this is this is who's in comedy, like monologists, uh, guys who seem like they're decent guys, blah blah blah." But then you, when you get into comedy, there's all kinds of people in comedy, you know. So Lenny's not a prototypical. I mean, the story that we one time we did, we one time we did, um, <laughs> one time we did, uh, <laughs> what the fuck? Norton said something so funny. I can't remember the line, but but uh, uh, Lenny I, Norton or Opie asked me to do the show. I said, "Can I bring Lenny?" Because we, I thought, let's promote the show. And Lenny's Lenny, we're funny together, so let's bring in Lenny. So Lenny didn't want to go because he had to go to his doctor. Hmm. I'm like Lenny, just reschedule, you know. But I Lenny Lenny was saying, I forget the line, but it was Norton had a really funny line. Basically, he's saying that. Lenny doesn't want to be, you know, Lenny's not like a, Lenny's not good in, in show business because he, he doesn't, he's, he doesn't have his priorities right. But also I think Lenny's basically afraid because, you know, Lenny's not a great comic. I mean, it's it, like if there's any kind of a commotion in the crowd, Lenny can't, Lenny's not funny off the top of his head, really. Mm -hmm. So, so if something happens, he's in a bit of a jam. If, if he gets heckles, he, he's in a jam because he'll just get upset. He won't be able to say something funny. And uh, so I think Lenny knows his limitations. So because of that, he doesn't, he, he, he doesn't, he, he can only, you know, he's a local comic. He's like, mm -hmm. if he lived in Chicago, he, he wouldn't have gotten on the Letterman show. If he lived in mm -hmm. Detroit, he wouldn't have gotten on the Letterman show because he only got on the Letterman show because it's a local show. You know, if you live in New York, if you're a New York comic, that's a local show. So, um, so once I started to realize all that, and then he didn't, he don't want to work the road with me because I was like, and then anybody, he worked JCCs. I mean, in the, right before we, he quit, uh, Atel was on and Atel was like, you guys should do gay. You guys should try to get gigs on the road. And I said, Lenny won't do them. Lenny won't work the road. And, uh, Atel looked at him. He's like, you won't. He goes, well, JCCs. 
Lenny actually said that to David <laughs> Tell. JCCs. And and Tell goes, JCC? He goes, Jewish Community Centers. And I was like, oh. and I was, it was depressing. It was depressing for me to even be a sidekick. You had to be associated saying, with that. Yeah, like, it's like Lenny will only work JCCs. Again, because it's a controlled environment. It's not mm. a comedy club. They're, yeah. It's a Jewish Community Center. So they're all going to be Jewish. They know he's Jewish. So they're going to be sympathetic. Even if he sucks, they're not going to fucking heckle him like a regular comedy club and he doesn't have to sell tickets because it's a fucking community center you know mm. but when he said that and it was just i was like this is this is sad this is like a sad dude that he thinks that that's that's like a real comedy that's Especially like a real com- in the presence of dave attell yeah like it just just why would he just lie instead of going instead of going um you know yeah i know i worked the road instead of just going like yeah we should work the road he'll go he, instead he didn't even deny it when i said he lenny won't work the road he could have just said i'll work the road instead he goes well jcc's and i was like oh my god i was like what are we f-? so i didn't know that i didn't know lenny i mean i knew lenny worked locally mm. but i didn't know he like i mean it's not like he was getting offers he wasn't turning down road work offers but oh. but most comics want to work outside of their comfort zone you know that's how basically how you get better well, I mean, he, is, he did cruises, I guess. Yeah, so again, he and anybody will tell <laughs> anybody will tell you cruises are not. It's not a gateway to fucking sitcom stardom. Like once oh, you're on a cruises, that's the that's that's the end of that road. Like that you're gonna Michaels be on doesn't scout cruises. Yeah, you're gonna. That's the end of the road. Like once you go on cruise, once you step on your first cruise ship, that's the beginning of the end of your mm-hmm. career. So, so uh, you know, but so it was all that and i was like and then bobby still acts like lenny something and i was like but i just know and then you see it over and over. i mean you see enough of people's behavior patterns you're like this is what he is so it's mm-hmm. like why are we pretending that he's like a real comic he's not a real comic um okay. and everyone disagrees with me everyone says <clears throat> he's a real comic well because he, he's been on letterman he's been on letterman because he lives in new york there's no way he was gonna be on any he's never been on any other show right, outside of right. new york because he's just he's a local guy he's a local guy and he he lives 20 blocks from from the letterman studio so he could take the fucking bus there so that's who <laughs> they use they use local guys because it's cheaper for them they don't have to put them up at, yeah. and it went by the time he got on letterman letterman didn't even give a shit letterman didn't care who they brought on he was already he was, he was already 30 for the last 10 years he was mailing it in absolutely. He didn't give a shit. I would ask, like, Ted Alexander had a set that was, like, one of the best sets I've ever seen. Hmm. I said, did Letterman say anything after? He goes, not really. The staff was, like, very complimentary. So hmm. Letterman at this point, I don't even know if he listened, if he just laughed when the crowd laughed. But So that's when Lenny got on. Lenny didn't get on when when Letterman show was happening. So um, moving on to um, Bill Burr. Um, so you chastised Bill Burr for a career based on fake outrage. So looking back, do you still stand by what you said? Uh, you know, here's the thing. People are going to think I'm caving. But the thing with Bill Burr, I, the one thing I say about Bill Burr now is that he's one of those guys that just has a great work ethic. And so I don't, I don't really ever think he thinks – that he's a fake because he's like, this is me. I'm, you know, I think he's always a little bit wound up just because he, he's not one of those guys that just sits around, you know? So mm-hmm. he wakes up, he's like, I'm going to do this. So he's not, he's not, he's the opposite of lazy, whatever that is. And a lot of comics are lazy. They smoke pot. They want to do nothing. They, they sit on their material, but Bill Burr is kind of like a guy who's a, he's a, he's a, you know he's a he's a hard working comic so i think he sees himself as like a blue collar guy from boston who's mm-hmm. had maybe had a good career and so when i said you know why why are you mad dude you're selling out arenas like you're really mad and he was he got mad that i said that you know mm-hmm. and uh and then it ended up being a really funny show because he was really he really resented but i was but i was genuinely baffled by him i'm like so we're supposed to pretend you're still mad when you're when you're when you make more in a night than all your fans do in a year you're we're supposed to pretend we're supposed to go like yeah he's mad Hmm. and then when you hear about what he's talking about it's like he's just talking about regular stuff so it's like but he i think he sees himself as like 
that this is my I'm a blue collar guy and this is this mm. is my blue collar act. But I look at him as like he's like an elite. Oh, and man. I just think I just think if I was him, I would be I would be I would have a hard time staying mad if I was I would be nervous as shit, honestly. If I was fucking going and if I was going to an arena to perform comedy by myself. If I was in a band, if I was in Led Zeppelin, I wouldn't be nervous. But I was if I was by myself performing at Madison Square Garden and I was the headliner, I would be fucking nervous. <laughs> so uh so that's what I would be. But he but he he's mad. He's <laughs> <laughs> I would be I would be nervous and I would be happy. I would, when I'm happy, I get nervous because I realize I'm not as funny when I'm happy mm. or when I'm in a good mood. So yeah, it's easy to do comedy when you're mad. So that's why I was like, I was like, wow, you're selling these many tickets and you're still mad. So I was kind of asking for myself, like, so, so I think you at could this point, it's, it's a bit of a character that he puts on. Um, it's a character, but but again, I think he thinks. I think he he never thinks like I'm I'm just. Cause he's he's like a hard-working guy he's just a blue collar mm. guy if he was a fucking plumber he would be like this i'm just a plumber. i just go to work and i make jokes and and you know he grinds out the podcast and he and you know so he's a hard-working guy and so i just think that's how he thinks of himself i'm just a blue collar guy from boston and so i'm not gonna i'm i'm not i'm not happy or mad i'm just bill burr you mm. know but i i was confused and i and i thought it was a good take to challenge no, I Bill liked Br- it. I mean, everybody liked I, it, didn't they? Yeah, I thought it was funny. I thought it was funny. I'm like, so, because I've known him for, like, I've never friends with him, but I've known him for a long time. So I'm like, so you're still mad. I just thought it was funny and a and bit of a dick move. And, and nobody's ever asked him because he was really taken aback, you know? Do you feel like he was a little over-defensive? Um... I, I don't know. I, he was, he was, I mean, it was early. Like he said, he was, it was, he had just come from doing Opie and Jim. So he got up early, you know, it's East coast time. He probably thinks he's just, is going to get a lot of softballs because him and Lenny are friends and I've known him. So he probably doesn't know the show. Yeah. And uh, so he, when I'm saying like, so instead of just, you know, good natured ribbing, uh, they, you know, I, 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 the one of the questions I was asking, he was really like, I thought at one point he was going to leave. I really thought he was going to leave. And then I pulled back a little bit cause I didn't want him to leave. Mm. I thought he was just going to get up and go, you know, fuck this. I don't need this. I'm, I'm fucking, I do arenas. You think I need this stupid fucking show? <laughs> yeah. So, so I pulled back a little bit and then they, then they, him and Lenny were ganging up on me and it ended up being a really funny show. And so, I mean, that's part of it. Like I know the show, I know, Listen, I just know the show's better if it's more authentic. And right, me right. Ask, and Bill Burr's reaction to me asking if he's, you know, basically implying that he's fake mad, you know, made the show more authentic. And I know Opie's not going to ask it. You know, I mean, no one's going to ask it. No one's going to be like, "So you're you're fake mad, and you you don't have a problem with that." Okay. Um, <laughs> yeah. Moving back to <laughs> moving back to Lenny. Um, so a number of the conflicts between yourself and Lenny came from your quest to faster monetize the show through things like t-shirts and donations <laughs> and his resistance to making money in favor of what seemed like more gradual growth given the infancy of the show. Do you feel like you could have handled the disputes better or do you still feel like you did the right thing? <laughs> I don't even know. I mean, looking back, listen, now... Um, I don't know because like the, this last week's been weird with, you know, with, with Kumia and, and all the, with everything happening. Mm. So like at some point I got to go, okay, where did I, like, did I push it too far? Was mm. I too, like, should I, should I, should I wrote it out more? Should it, you know, cause the waiting for the, the growth of the show and, but I mean, there was two factors was that, um, was that Bobby Kelly's dumb and, and Lenny and Bobby Kelly's are friends. They eat lunch together every Tuesday. So, hmm. so that was a, that was a recipe for disaster, all pun intended because of Bobby Kelly's a fat recipe. fuck. <laughs> but, um, but that was a recipe for disaster because Lenny, like I, at that point I was, I was separated from my wife. So I had two rents, I had two everything, you know? So, so I couldn't wait. And also I knew waiting wasn't going to get us anywhere because Bobby didn't have a plan and every plan that Bobby had, none of them made any money. So I just knew that at some point it was going to be, um, 
at some point it was going to be, it wasn't going to work. Like it, it was, the show was only going to go so far because of the combination of Bobby's management skills mm. and Lenny being a fucking baby. So, um, <laughs> so, and also, I, also I wasn't thinking like, like even with the Atel thing, when he said JCCs and it was just like, at some point, Lenny's like a fat girl. You know what I mean? Like, 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 like when your friends, when you, when your friends, you know, see you and like, this is my girlfriend. And then it's like a fat girl or something. Like I hate the shit on fat women, but, but I'm just saying it's like, Lenny was like almost embarrassing. You know, that was, for me, that was embarrassing that when he said to a tell like JCCs, it's like, Lenny's not a real comic. So, so uh, it was just, so all, everything was like adding up to, to it not going anywhere it just it, it was gonna it was gonna hit a wall and speaking of wall bobby wanted to do like a paywall and it was just and that was when patreon was first starting and bobby was like now we're gonna do a, everything he, every plan he had was so dumb i was like wow these guys are bobby's dumb bobby's a dumb guy and then lenny you know lenny it would be like an o and a was was happening and Opie was always beholden to management. Like the reason O and A work was because they were both against management. Right. So they were they were they were a team against management. Kumi had just told me a story when I did a show last week. He said he said O and A, they he said they had a meeting when they were in Boston. The the the, the station manager said, Don't do this anymore. You guys gotta stop doing this. So they go, okay. They went right back to the studio and kept and did exactly what he said not to do. So so they were they were against management. Mm-hmm. Lenny was Lenny and Lenny and Bobby were were a, a team basically against me. I, so so whatever I wanted to do, they were like, we're not doing it. And they so there's no way you can't if Lenny's beholden to Bobby. So at some point I gotta go like this is this doesn't work. And then Lenny didn't want to tour i mean not that we're going to tour but lenny didn't want to do shows together Hmm. and then we did a live show together and lenny was like looking at his papers the whole time and i'm like and he wasn't saying funny things because lenny's lenny's just lenny's a sidekick lenny's a fucking host he's he's basically a uh he was basically the the engineer of the show or 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 the soundboard i'm i don't know what word i'm looking for but lenny was not it's not like we're gonna go to hot to to the great heights of radio Hmm. Lenny part and partly because he was, you know, he was, he's more, he's, he's a, fr- he, he wants to be friends with management. He he wants, Lenny wants to do the right thing, even though, even though most of the time it was dumb, but he was friends with Bobby and he was like, let's do it this way. Mm. And, and I wanted to make money. And, and also I didn't want to fucking like, I mean, I got fired. I got fired by Lauren Michaels. So, so, and one of the things I used to tell myself was like, you should have been more fucking reckless back then, but it's hard when you're at SNL to be reckless because it's like that's a good job, you know. Mm. Yeah. So, so once I was doing this shit, I was like, "Fuck them!" You think I'm gonna play, play with Bob by Bobby Kelly's rules? I mean, it's one thing to play by SNL rules or by network television rules or Letterman or whatever, but it's another thing to play by Bobby Kelly's fucking rules. And we're not, he's not paying me and we're not making money, but I'm still supposed to be like, okay, Bobby, what should I do next? Like, fuck him. <laughs> Plus at the time you were, you were literally, I, I can only assume you were, you were near the one or two positions on a riot cast as far as popularity is concerned. Yeah, he said, he said when the last time he did my show, they got him on my show and he said, uh, he said, I was the fastest, gr- fastest growing show they ever had. And I said, so that's how you treat the the talent. I said, I was the talent on the show. Mm. You know, Lenny was good as Lenny, but I was the talent on the show. So that's how you, tr- that's how as a, as, as a businessman, that's how you think you should treat the talent on the show of yeah. the fastest growing show you've ever had at Riotcast. Like, treat me like shit have lunch with have lunch with lenny every tuesday you never had i mean he would always take lenny's side because he didn't even know what my fucking side was admittedly so i was like i was like for, uh, huh? it, made, it made for great radio admittedly all of this yeah it was it was a train wreck listen i tried to keep it like on track for as long as i could like i would talk to gnome i would talk to different people and they would be like just just stick it out it's people love the show mm. you know, ride it out as long as you can 
and and then I did, I did, like I, I I did, and then and then you know, and then even the new incarnations of the show, there's always a problem. Like even now, we're having a problem with fucking Chad Zumok. So, so, uh, <laughs> so there's, it's always a problem. Yeah. Like it's always a problem, and I that's what I'm saying. Like I at some point, the the one regret I have about Lenny was because is I used to send him some fucking brutal text, you know, which I don't do anymore. Like I don't, I never text. Um, like if I have a sidekick, I never text them. If I have a problem with them, I'll call them. Cause I, mm. you know, cause text is kind of like a cowardly way to fucking tell somebody to fuck off. So I, st- I, l- I did learn from that. Like, don't, don't fucking be a bitch and text people something nasty. Just call them and do it, do it like a man or a woman. <laughs> <laughs> do women ever say that? You'd be a woman and, yeah, and woman. call somebody. No. So I did, you know, I did learn some stuff from, from, from the, the, the first incarnation of Misery Loves Company. Mm-hmm. And and again, people say it was the best, you know, they said, you know, that show was the best and blah, but it wasn't gonna last. And and then somebody just sent me a text a couple days ago. They said, oh, Brian, you, Brian McCarthy and Adam was the greatest show of all. And then you, you ruined that till I'm like, I don't ruin it. They, you know, they quit, but it's like, so people can fight about which, which was the best. I don't care. I mean, I got to keep moving on, you know, yeah. because again, again, like I told Bobby, like I told anybody, we, it, we didn't have management keeping it at, at when me and Lenny did it, we didn't have management keeping us together. We had basically management doing a bad job. Also, we weren't making money. If we were making money, that's a different story. If I were making like five grand a week, mm-hmm. I'd be like, yeah, let's keep it together. I don't care. Yeah, you saw that Anthony and Opie had their issues, but there was that thing in the middle of them, the big pile of money that they were making that was always going to draw them together and always going to solve Yeah, because that's problems. that's common sense. You don't walk away from a lot of money. So right. I'm, we're, I'm walking away from nothing with, yeah. with, with the hope of, you know, monetizing it. But Bobby didn't know how to monetize anything, so... Well, that works into the next question is is regarding the paywall show which obviously sort of set the wheels in motion as far as the the, the breakup is concerned so your eventual split with lenny came after he sided with riotcast over the suggestions of a paywall for an exclusive live show so uh, the thing I'm, I'm thinking though is given your previous attempts to generate income through the show virtue of obviously you having to pay two rents that sort of thing um was it a bit of a difficult thing to come to was it a bit of a difficult realization that actually we could make money quickly here through monast- through through paywalling this live show was that a difficult <laughs> no i don't even i don't i don't I'm, i don't understand the question actually oh sorry um so the, the question is essentially you could have uh, a free show might have generated views but not not necessarily given you immediate income Whereas a paywalled show would have generated income relatively quickly, um, so why uh, could a compromise not have been reached, or why why the turnaround? Why why suddenly um, were you not interested in in making that quick quick book? Well, wait. So what what's the story that that you that you're going by? Um, so from my understanding is that uh, Lenny sided with Riotcast. Um, he sided with Bobby Kelly, who wanted to put a paywall behind the live show. They wanted it so so that no one could access it apart from paid Riotcast subscribers. Now, my understanding is that there was still a relatively large appetite for that live show. I was definitely one of the ones that would be willing to pay for it. And you could have made um, not a lot of money, but it, it would have generated income immediately for you. So my question really is, was that a difficult decision for you to make to uh, not want it behind a paywall. <laughs> um, I, I I don't remember exactly what happened. That was when everything was getting very blurry, and that was when you know Keith the cop was showing up and you know trying to, was talking to me about coming over do a show over at Compound Media. Um, I remember. I just remember since I, since I didn't really know what was going on, I didn't know how the paywall was going to work. I remember just, I remember saying to, to, uh, to Sprance and Bobby Kelly, I said, why don't you guys put the shows that are popular behind the paywall? Like the, like when we had Michael Che or Billy Burr or David Tell put the shows that, that, 
people would pay to listen to, like just put some behind the paywall. Mm. And they said, and then, and then because that was in the talks with the, what should we do with the live show? Should we put it behind the paywall or should we put it out for free? And everything, I'm, I'm not even kidding. Like everything I suggested, they said, we can't do it. I said, so they said they can't put out some shows behind the paywall. They have to put all of them or none of them. And I was like, hmm. Is, that can't be true. Like you, you, they don't have the technology, so you can put some shows behind a paywall, and not others. So it was almost like they didn't. They were so mad at me at that point that they didn't want. Even if I made a suggestion that made sense, because I'm like, I just thought, I thought first of all, if you put it out for free, it'll obviously more people will see it. And we already made a little bit of money off the live show, you know, people paying tickets. Mm -hmm. But it, I, but it was just, it was his, it was in the whole conversation of um, paywall, not paywall. What should be, what should be behind the paywall? And Bobby was hung up on the paywall. I'm like, and I just, and he, whenever he would explain the paywall to me, he goes, well, he would always say, well, Mark Marin has a paywall. And I said, yeah, well, Mark Marin's doing interviews with people and so they're basically timeless i said mm. so you think someone's gonna listen to a you know what dude with with joe list and and Giannis papas like <laughs> yeah, like they can the just wait events. they can wait three weeks and they'll be back again it's like it's this it's a it's like no one's gonna listen to old you know what dudes <laughs> So, so I try to explain to him like Mark Marin has this specific kind of show. You don't have that kind of show. We don't have that kind of show or like, mm. so I kept trying to explain it to them. And, and I was right. Like I'm always right. I mean, not always, but a lot of times I'm right. And then mm. when I get proven right, I'm already fired, you know? So, so Bobby wanted to do a paywall. He did a paywall for his show. And then, and then he discontinued it after a, a while, and because it didn't work, because what I was, what I said was true. Now, people aren't going to pay to listen to you know what, dude, an old you know what, dude. Like, mm. I, I mean, seriously, the, the whole thing was: if you listen now, you get it for free. Like all that stupid. Like, if you listen on Wednesday, you get it for free. If you listen on Thursday, you got to pay a dollar. Like, I was like, that's all dumb. So the Patreon obviously was the way to go. Yeah, and now Bob, now Bobby has a Patreon, and people kept saying to me, "Patreon, Patreon, page." I remember one guy, uh, it was like, uh, you know, the Willy Wonka. Whenever a guy got a golden ticket, that yeah. Slugworth or whatever would show up, and he would like <laughs> yeah. he would start he would start whispering to them. So, <laughs> whenever I did a live show, whenever I did anything, and this one guy, I forget his name, but his name was Rob, but he would show up and be like, "You got to do a Patreon." So I didn't even know, <laughs> I didn't even know what it was, you know. <laughs> but uh, but he was right. Patreon yeah. was the way to go. But again, Bobby would have never done it because uh, he would have said, no, you got to do this. And even if I would have said, so they would have never done it to spite me. And yeah. then Lenny would have taken his side and then it wouldn't have gone anywhere. Yeah, but because to, it was your suggestion. It yeah. Was awful and wrong. Yeah. And I wasn't, I wasn't, I wasn't particularly, I got to be right. I was like, well, I was just thinking the obvious situ scenarios of like, well, this won't make money and this mm -hmm. might make money because I needed money at the time. I, I mean, I still need money, but, mm. but I, but to be fair to all that being said, it was a good show. And also, uh, also, uh, you know, when you do lose a sidekick, it's, it is, it's like losing your girlfriend. Like you think it's like, next girlfriend's a real fucking, you know what, but, uh, but then, then you got to get a new one and then you date other, <laughs> then you're, then you're fishing around and you think you got one and then it turns mm. out to be wants to beat the shit out of you in studio and so yeah, there's a yeah. there's all kinds of so so i'm aware of that too people go like oh this that guy was great or you should get rid of this guy but then you got to get somebody else you know so so lenny was good at the beginning lenny was good but then all and then lenny didn't have lenny didn't have financial responsibilities that i did like i did so he was like no let no we're fine and lenny kept saying no we'll just do what bobby says and because Lenny didn't need money at the time. He wasn't married, didn't have a family, but now he probably needs money. Yeah, yeah. Um, speaking of uh, sort of sidekicks, why Jimmy Martinez? <laughs> <laughs> this is really memory lane. Uh, Jimmy, <laughs> no, Jim, I knew Jimmy for a long time, and then he kept saying, like, I would see him, because everybody, I mean, 
the reason I knew my podcast was good was because every people who I didn't even know very well would be like, oh, you're, I like your podcast. I would see him at a club. I go, oh, your podcast podcast is great. Or they would tweet something. And But Jimmy was like, I heard, oh, I got to get on your podcast. So he got on. And then uh, the first time I got on, I remember, I guess, uh, but but uh, but then I was like, this is good because he's totally the anti Lenny. And um, and then, you know, and then and then he was, but then then he he was he was unpredictable. He was unreliable, you know, <laughs> like sometimes he, I mean, sometimes he would want to beat the shit. I mean, then sometimes he wouldn't. So, you know, yeah, speaking of uh, that, the, I mean, the the famous moments of volatility between him and yourself him throwing uh, I, I don't know exactly what he threw at you but uh how certain were you that he wouldn't hit you or, or were you prepared for that i was zero percent certain i mean and i i forget what the what the cameras show but like i was i was sure he was gonna at least hit punch me once so that was again that was a great show i remember when when he left um and again i had no intention of instigating that to that level but when he left i I remember i said to adam i said did you get all that i mean i said are we still like on he goes yes it's great radio (laughs) this is great radio (laughs) well i don't know exactly what it was but basically i was like are we still doing the show now and lenny and adam's like yeah it's fucking great so that's when i was like oh yeah it probably is great that that jimmy wanted to beat the shit on me and then he didn't and then he left but yeah i was sure he was going to hit me and uh you know i guess i disrespected him enough that he was going to hit me and if he would have hit me would have gone viral like it went kind of semi-viral but it never went like crazy viral and then even with that um i asked adam the other day i go where is i said isn't there a clip of just because i have the episode but i said isn't there a clip of just jimmy like a short clip that i that and 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 adam said yeah jimmy i mean uh bobby has it a right because he wouldn't let us he because it, it's the riot cast studio or something some bullshit you know what i mean where mm-hmm. bobby's like no it's our studio it's our it's our company so we so it's our we own it we own the property and that's when you just go like so you're you're trying to you're trying to limit like i can't see that like it was just always like a dumb um, you know, this is my ball. I'm going to take mm. my ball and go home. That's what Bobby always, his approach towards everything instead of like, yeah, what's like, let's, let's make this. And that's just so, uh, whatever about Bobby was like, he was from O and a, but he was always like, Brennan, you're nuts. It's like, that's, that's what, that's, that's where you came from. That's yeah. your training. That's O and a, O and a was always nuts. So it's like, so, so now that you have a show that people like you, you, you keep trying to rein it in and then even almost got beat up by a black guy in the studio and and then he bobby was more worried about like food people eating food up there i was like you're just stupid dude it it just got to a point where i'm like i couldn't even talk to him like i couldn't even fucking stand seeing him you know um why so so can you break down exactly what was going through jimmy's mind obviously you were um sort of taunting him with that phone call that you were going to make. Could you break down exactly why do you think he got so rattled? Well, I think he was like a little, I think he was drunk. I think he had been drinking. I think he hadn't slept much the night before. And I think he was just in a really funky mood. And um, I didn't know all this, but right before we did the show, he like, there was, there was, he, he asked Carrie Carawas, he goes, is there anything in the, there, they have a little refrigerator there. He says, is there anything in the fridge there? And there was like a one can of beer. <laughs> and he just drank the whole, he just downed the whole thing. And I was like, this, and we, it was like 12 in the afternoon <laughs> on a Monday. And uh, so it was, and then the show started out funny. Like you could tell he was just like in a weird mood, but it was funny, you know, cause I didn't mm. care. Like I knew, I, I, I didn't care how weird the show got. Cause I just know that was better for the, listeners because like i said every podcast is the same right you know it's just guys sitting around trying to be funny where like this is more like authentic shit so the more authentic it is the better so i knew he was in a weird mood and then um so then it just got weirder and weirder and then and then i just think he was like if if we could have kept feeding him beers i think he would have been all right but 
I think he was just getting like cranky and no, mm. you know, when you want to drink more and, but there's no alcohol, you just, you're like, yeah, fucking, yeah. you're just annoyed and you just want, you know, something. So, but I was sure he's going to hit me. And then, uh, but I remember Bobby was like thrilled that I almost got beat up there because he was <laughs> like, he was like, see, Lenny wouldn't have never done that. I'm like, that's right. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, so, but he's talking about good radio. Lenny would never have done that. No, but he was, he was, his, his attitude was like, see what happens when you got rid of the nice guy and this is what you're going to have to deal with some real fucking, some real dangerous motherfuckers. And I was like, oh. that's, I mean, I was aware of like, okay, maybe I, maybe I should have, I didn't, I didn't go looking for Lenny, <laughs> <laughs> but I was like, yeah, I, maybe I got to be careful. Maybe I should be more careful about who. So, um, who I let in. speaking of Bobby Kelly. Um, could you talk a little bit about why Bobby Kelly decided to kick you off his Riotcast platform and how much of that had to do with um, with Keith Moreska's poaching of you to... Uh, oh, I always him? love every, every, uh, every whatever you call, whatever you have a picture of Pete, uh, Keith Moreska in your documentaries, it makes me laugh every time. What, what I don't know what you refer to him as, a failed police officer whatever it always it's it's always it always makes me laugh every goddamn time (laughs) i mean listen the the thing was that uh bobby doesn't even remember what happened because he was he he i did my i did a show i did a zoom show with bobby a couple months ago and Mm -hmm. uh we were rehashing it because chad zumach chad zumach was uh uh, was asking about it and Bobby was like Bobby thought that I had um, breached his contract because I he, he said I already got hired at Compound Media and I was doing shows at Compound Media um, while I was still doing shows at Riotcast which wasn't true so it, it's it's a moot point it doesn't really matter but the mm-hmm. point is Bobby doesn't even remember the point was that I Keith wanted me to do a show at um at at the compound media and then i'm like yeah why not do two shows why why not just do a show here right. compound media is you have a different audience uh it's on tv it's uh i thought we'd do a show with jimmy martinez if jimmy martinez comes at me there's people there to break it up it's on tv so he'll he'll get arrested like it's not going to be like oh brennan got beat up who was it just look at the look at the video you know mm-hmm. so i thought it would be a good show like a you know uh, black cop white cop kind of a show and mm. and uh, we wouldn't solve any murders but it would just be like <laughs> that kind of a thing like ri- like uh maybe like, you should have done the riot cast show in a wig and funny glasses maybe that would <laughs> yeah no if we did like a Nick Nolte Eddie Eddie Murphy kind of a thing oh yeah so uh, <laughs> so uh, so uh, but Bobby wouldn't have any, he wouldn't have he would he said if you do a show somewhere else you're not going to do a show here and I was like all right I, I was like okay so and then also you know Voss was doing a show at Ridecast he was also doing it at at um at Opie's network and right. Florentine was doing a show at Ridecast he was also doing a, a show at Sirius Satellite Radio so it was like I'm like Bobby you have a fucking like I'm I'm the fastest growing show you have at the network I mean he didn't tell me that now then he told me that like after the fact but mm. I'm like, so why would you, you're going to let me walk because I want to do a show, one show a week at fucking Compound Media? It's like, it made no sense because plus I'm not making any money at Riotcast. So they're going to pay me a couple of shekels over at Compound Media. It's like, wh- why, you know, I- I'm not I'm not doing five days a week at Compound Media. I'm doing one show there, one show here. And he wouldn't, mm. he wouldn't have it because I think he's like, I put you on the map uh you know you're disrespectful and all the shit i was like oh my god bobby's it's just it, so he wouldn't and then keith had to negotiate me getting out of the bobby kelly contract even though there was no really it wouldn't have held up in like of judge judy i don't know if you know her but yeah, she, yeah, yeah. like if judge judy brought if we brought this to court she'd find she'd go like you're holding this man to a contract you pay him no money he's got a family like are you are you joking like you're a comic <laughs> you're a comic i know but you are you joking you think he's really gonna like this contract will stand up in court where you pay him nothing and he can't go and the contract didn't he was the contract said 
I couldn't do Misery Loves Company somewhere else. It didn't say I couldn't do another show somewhere else. I could. Right, right. My lawyer said, you can do another show somewhere else. You have to call it something else. And I was like, okay, that's easy. I'll just name it something else. And we did. And Bobby was like, okay. But again, Bobby's dumb. I please, please call the show Bobby's dumb, please. I will, I will, <laughs> I will make it worth your while financially. No, it's just, it's like, I, I was like, man, I'm growing up. I mean, I, I, I had meetings with Lauren Michaels and now I'm talking to Bobby Kelly where right. he's like, you can't go somewhere else and you're not going to get paid. And, and Keith wants you to do a show. And, and, you know, I didn't even know Kumia that well, but I'm like, well, I know Kumia is kind of a legend. So why not be, you know, he's probably got a fan base over there and he did. So like, why not, why can't I, you know, get, get, uh, two fan bases, get a piece of two fan bases. You sure. Know? Um, so, you, you then went on to uh, hire a middle-aged blind man in Brian McCarthy as your next co-host. Um, what was the thinking behind that? Um, <laughs> Brian, I didn't... He was just available. Like, he, he you know, he, he was just super available. He didn't He didn't have a job. He was looking for something to do. So I, he, 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 I met him through Eddie Ift, as, as my Wikipedia used to say, b-level comedian eddie ift mm. and uh so eddie was like this guy wants to he wants to do your show uh i said the only he said the only drawback is he's blind you know so i was like oh so i just thought he wouldn't be able to see he'd be walking into everything i don't even know how we get to the studio so and then he got to the studio and then and then you know the first show we did i remember he said well should i come back next week and me and adam kind of looked at each other like I guess. I don't know. Cause at that point I had trouble getting guests because I was doing one show at Compound Media and then and then I was doing Misery Loves Company at the comic strip. So I was always mm -hmm. it was always hard to get guests. So I'm like, All right, come back next week. And then one thing led to another and then the fans started to like him and, and he was silly. I mean, like he was definitely different than Lenny. Mm. He would drink a lot. Lenny didn't drink at all. Lenny was a stiff. And then Brian was like a drunk. He was like a class clown, would do anything for a laugh. Yeah. And then he was, you know, and he was easy to deal with, really, because he didn't, you know, he didn't, he wasn't really asking me for money. I paid him. Like I eventually started to pay him pretty decently, but, but, um, but, he, you know, he, he, you know, he kept telling me how rich he was. And I was like, well, that's good. So I won't have to pay you. And then, um, and then he was always, he would always say, yes. I said, can you do this show? He'd go, yep. Cause he didn't have a job and he had nothing to do. So that's really what it came down to. And then, then the fans started liking him cause he was just the opposite of me. And, uh, so, and then one thing led to another and then. <laughs> yeah. Um, so it's like I have all these wives, past wives, where it's like, <laughs> yeah, you've. And then what happened with her? It's like, it always starts yeah. out. It always starts out good, and it's like it's you know I do have problems. It's like, hmm. you know, I think after a while, I just whoever I'm in the room with, I'm just gonna be like, I don't pick at them, but it's like you know after a while you you start to realize like, what like how how they're how they're stupid you know or if you if you right so right after all it's like being in a marriage where you just go like at first the stuff your wife does is cute mm. and then after a while you're like wow this is fucking she does it she, she won't stop doing it it becomes annoying you know yeah yeah um so moving on to uh rt lang and uh we're not far off from the end by the way uh but okay What's your? No, I don't care. It's just I don't care. It's my but my kids. Uh, my kids, they'll be fine. They, they don't have school tomorrow. Oh, anyway. okay. But um, they probably can't hear me anyway. <laughs> uh, what's your favorite Artie Lang anecdote? My favorite are 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 from Dan Filato. <laughs> used to be his manager, hmm. and he he tells the like the stories you get from Artie are his version, and then you started to get from Dan are probably pretty close to what actually happened so like when when like the art when Artie fell on his uh i don't even know how to say this. remember when Artie got his nose punched in yeah yeah <laughs> <laughs> you got a sort of frying pan to the face yeah so that really supposedly that that didn't happen at all like it wasn't that it wasn't that dramatic really so yeah yeah i mean that's the thing like Artie just Artie, i think Artie said he got beat up by his bookie or something or yeah. something 
Yeah, so I think that was the story that he got beat up by his bookie. So I met, I actually met Dan through when I did Artie's show at Artie's house, and so and then Dan started to. Um, so and then once he stopped working with Artie, he would like we you know we don't talk very much, but we talk once in a while, and he'll mm-hmm. tell me, but Artie didn't get punched in the face. <laughs> He just and, and so Artie knows what what is good for is a good story for mm. for, for page for the for the, for the New York Post and for like his fans. But like supposedly he like he tripped and he fell on his face or something. Oh no! Oh dear! <laughs> so every Artie story is basically like either a lie or completely embellished. Any story <laughs> that any story that you've ever heard is just. The real story is, and the the real story is actually much more is much funnier. But Artie always yeah. wants it to be, Artie always wants to be like the tragic hero in all his stories, you know. Yeah, rather than the bumbling fool who uh, yeah, whether the guy stumbled onto his face and yeah, he broke. tripped, he tripped and he he fell on his face, and, and now he's he, a cartoon nose for the rest of his life. <laughs> but he said he said he got punched by his bookie. Mm, yeah, <laughs> and he posted the picture. He posted the picture. I guess he. Yeah. whatever anyway is there any work that can be done to fix that is i mean i don't know much about rhinoplasty i don't know but... they 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 do stuff don't they do face transplants yeah they, i was yeah, thinking if they, they can could... tra- transplant a face they can put a bit of something in your nose to prop it up yeah, a little bit put them like a fucking gorilla nose or something like <laughs> I, I mean can't they get like a another mammal and then just fucking <laughs> i mean at like this an point anteater or something yeah at this point i don't even know uh I don't even know if Artie even cares anymore because he's. Mm. I don't think he's doing that well with the ladies anyway. Yeah, I think Vanity left Artie uh, decades ago. Um, speaking of Artie, though, uh, what would you say were the was the origin of your on-air disputes with Artie Lang? Listen, he. he uh, oh God. <laughs> I mean, I didn't. I again, I didn't know Artie that well. Like, I didn't. Again, I was. I didn't listen to Howard Stern because I didn't have the. I didn't have a car. Mm. So I know people are gonna people listen. It's gonna be like, get a fucking car, dude. I, but it's like when you live in New York, you just you don't. If you don't need a car, you don't have one because you got to worry about parking and yeah. I live in London, stuff. so it's the same thing. Yeah. So it's just it becomes like uh, it becomes ridiculous. So um, so but my wife was a big uh, O and A. I mean, not a, a biggest stern big a big stern fan. Hmm. So I remember one time Artie gave me a ride home. And um, from uh, from New York, from New York City, he was. I saw him at the cellar, or whatever. He said, "You want to ride home?" Yeah, he actually said, "You want to ride home?" We we're at the cellar, and then, and then he goes, "Yeah, I'm parked over here." We walked all the way to another comedy club. Like he had parked it near the stand, which is at like at that point it was at Third Avenue. So it was like a 20 minute walk. I'm like, I could be home already, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so that's why I was like, this guy's a fucking maroon. So, <laughs> so, um, so I told my wife, I go, yeah, Artie Lang gave me a ride home. She's like, oh my god. She goes, she was all like, you know, smitten. Was, yeah, starstruck. And so, uh, so I think the next time I saw Artie, I'm like, yeah, my wife was. So he goes, yeah, so, um, you know, maybe I, I can meet her or something. I don't know something like that. Anyway, so, so then, so then I. So then when I quit doing uh, MLC, I don't know, something happened. I, I just had trouble getting guests and I and Artie, I said, Artie, you want to do my show? And then he said, well, why don't you do my show? I said, well, let's do a simulcast. I'll do your show. You do, We both air it on our respective whatever platforms. Mm-hmm. So that was the plan. And then, but then when I went to his house, like, he he was like he was there but he was like and he he we waited for an hour like the show started the show started super late the mm-hmm. guy who gave me a ride over he lives in my building because he was an arty fan too and i said to them i said to him let's just go say we only got parking for two hours because him and uh dan was there so they he he was calling for dan for something so then when dan went to the check on arty um i said to my friend i said let's i said let's just say we got to leave uh you know after whatever time it was because i don't want to stay this, this, mm. we already done some of the episode but it sucked Artie was just on something and he was just insulting me and he makes me wait for an hour then he insults me you know 
you know, kneel this, kneel that. I was like, geez, I'm like, oh my God, you're a fucking, you're a basket case. So, <laughs> so, so we left. Right. And then, um, so then somebody said, but I, when I was there, I did a Facebook live or something. I put up like, I'm at Artie Lang's house. I'm going to release this as an MLC uh, next week or this Friday, whatever I said. And then, so somebody asked me a couple of days after that, when are you going to release that MLC with Artie? And they, I think they tagged Artie. So I said, I said, yeah, it's not going to work out. It's, it's not, it's not going to be, it's not, it's not up to uh, MLC uh, standards. <laughs> <laughs> so Artie yeah. fucking flipped. He, it was good Friday. My wife was working. She worked like at a, at retail. So, you yeah. know, she had to work, but I was with the kids, you know, good. It's like, I don't want to be with my kids all fucking, uh, you know, it's just, it's like, you know, I got I, like, I, I'm a good dad, but I don't want to, it's just when I got to be with them, like when they have a day off, they have, they have for Good Friday, and then I got to be with them all day, and I got to like entertain them, and then Artie's coming at me hard, so I'm already like kind of like ugh, you know, because mm. I probably got to do spots that night. I'm just tired. I'm just whatever, and so Artie's coming at me hard on that about that tweet, and then all his fans are coming at me hard, and I really thought Artie had like hundreds of thousands of fans because I was getting hit pretty hard, but I think it's just a small, a small uh uh group but they come at your heart so anyway so um so then i got really mad he's like he's talking about my wife and my kids because you know i'd already told him my wife likes them and you know so he was he was just being real fucking pathetic so then and then i just kind of just let it go i didn't see yeah. him and then he then he got hired at by anthony to do the a and a show and um so you know i kept avoiding him but um, but Allie, the woman with books, it goes like just do the show with them. So I yeah. so I did a show with them, and then um, and then um, you know, and then I already thought it was just like I was joking that I was mad, but I was like mm. really, I was like you're a piece of shit. You're like a fucking, <laughs> you do cocaine and you're fat. Like pick one, pick you know. <laughs> so which is like my old, my friends, Mark Cohen's joke about David Crosby, <laughs> <laughs> but it still works. With yeah, Artie Lang. yeah, it's perfect. So, <laughs> <laughs> and Artie steal people, steals people's jokes all the time. He tells the Danny Thomas story every fucking show he does. Artie so, tells um, jokes. Yeah, 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 that was part of it too. Cause people were, Artie was like, Artie goes, Artie would say like, well, you, you're a great comic. I go, yeah, compared to you, I am. Cause you know, Artie was like, he was not like a joke guy. He was more like famous. And then he would tell stories and he would tell gambling stories. So, so this whole thing of like, I had, everybody had to pretend Artie was so great and mm -hmm. that he was clean. And there was a lot of pretending with Artie. So I was like, fuck him. Like, I, so I would do, there was like a, on my YouTube, uh, page it's like there's a there's a somebody put up the chad when i when i did a um ran about artie yeah um yeah. and it was it was true and then artie said he saw it he goes he was howling i mean who knows if he was howling or not but anyway so he goes he goes it was hilarious you blah 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 and I, but basically i was just saying you know me you know artie says he kills and everybody says he kills i've never seen him kill i've never seen him do well i'm sure he does well you know when he had his fan base and he would sell out when he was doing on the stern show but when he now when he comes to the comic clubs he doesn't kill so this whole thing you got to pretend because the guy's famous you got to pretend what he says is true it's like fuck that you well, know having to having to sit through some of those um aa shows and listening to artie tell the same um buffy the vampire slayer anecdote <laughs> for the seventh time the whole uh it's uh i, I, I can't even remember the punchline now it was but it was Dreadful. I don't remember that. I don't even know that story. It was something like, um, uh, I, I, you know, I can't even remember. It it wasn't very good, but it was it was painfully repetitive, and he would tell it every third episode um, with without fail. Well, failed. Well, failed. Uh, however, you call, whatever you describe Keith as failed uh, New York City police. <laughs> <laughs> Keith Maresca. Even the way you say his name, you don't even say. Keith the cock we say Keith Mareska. Oh God, I laugh every time. Anyway, so uh so you say so um Keith told me one time, uh, you know, they used to do Monday through Thursday. So yeah. Keith said that already ended and already ended the Thursday episode telling a story. And then the following Monday he started he told the same story the following Monday. And I guess right. he doesn't I guess he doesn't remember. That was it. That was it. It, it was um 
something that Artie Lang, he, he, t- he tell this anecdote where he was with his uncle Tony <coughs> and uh, Buffy the Vampire Slayer would come on the television and his uncle Tony would, would say to Artie, like, what's this show? Uh, what, what's, oh no, sorry, Artie would say to Uncle Tony, who was a big fan of Buffy the Vampire Slayer, hey, Uncle Tony, what's this show about? And then he would say, a Jew broad fights Draculas. And that was the joke. <laughs> and he, was, he thought that was such a good story yeah he thought it was such a good story he'd tell it three times a week for the whole duration of his... <laughs> yeah, it was so frustrating well, I mean it's through. it's funny in telling it but it's not funny when you're like a subscriber and it's not mm. funny for Kumia to have to pretend that like he hadn't just told that story you know so well, I, I just like the only reason I remember that there is there's a tweet that he put out where he's advertising his book and he's quoting that exact anecdote in the tweet as well so clearly he's a big fan of it as, uh, <laughs> I don't know if his book is just that tweet over and over and over again for 300 pages but I wouldn't be surprised but moving on to uh, Bill Schultz next who's another one of your favorites oh god um, who watches Morning with Bill Schultz <laughs> uh, <laughs> so i got a cough drop um i listen i i don't like i i said last week i, I don't know i don't know if you're up to date on everything am, but yeah, yeah. you know dave landau quit mm. and uh i you know and i when i saw bill schultz when i went to compound media last week i was like i wasn't even I don't even have a beef with Bill Schultz anymore. I don't think because it was just Bill Schultz is Bill Schultz. Like he's, he's hung up on the eighties. He, you know, he, he still acts like the, the, you know, he talks about the Chicago bulls and the bears from the eighties and the bulls. From he's the talking 90s. about a different kind of bear though. probably. <laughs> so he, so he's like, I'm like, he's not, you know, he talks about old movies. Like, to me, that's the saddest kind of a guy where it's just, he's so stuck in a certain time where, yeah. where you're like, you know, obviously it's like his best years are behind him. And he's just, at this point, he doesn't even know what's going on, but he's just, he, he's hanging on to his past mm. and you know, his, where he grew up in Chicago. If you, if you love Chicago so much, move back to Chicago. They, they'd have you, the rents are cheaper there. So, so I don't, with the Bill Schultz thing, I, I, it's like, it's another thing by Keith Maresca where you just kind of shake where you scratch your head or shake your head or whatever you do. And you go, I, I listen at this point, you know, they made mistakes. People make mistakes. You know, right, I, right. I, I don't even, I don't even begrudge people making mistakes, but I mean, it's like, I mean, it's, I mean, but that, that was kind of an obvious one, you know, like hiring Bill Schultz and hiring Artie Lang. They were, they were kind of obvious. But it's, and... it, it's amplified more that Bill Schultz, first of all, is getting four days a week, and second, he's um, following on from an incredibly popular guy in Gavin McGuinness as well. It, it was, um, yeah, it's just a, a bit of a strange one from a viewer's perspective. Obviously, there's probably only so much you can really go into, but from a viewer's perspective, to see a show like Burning Bridges struggle to get the two days a week that it, that it gets, <laughs> and then... To, to have to endure things like morning with Bill Schultz for four days a week just seemed a little bit... Uh, just, I just couldn't work out the sort of business decision. I understand that he they wanted it to be a bit more broad, and a, a, but I thought that was against what ONA and the whole philosophy of, of that was all about. They, they weren't trying to be broad. It was about funny comedy, that kind of stuff. But I don't know, I just never yeah, really I think- understood it. I think that I mean I I they ne- I was never privy to the meetings, but once I had, started to complain or whatever, once I mm. first wanted to say you know I, I was going to take off because I was doing one week one day a week, I wasn't making any money, and it was like, and and I it just it, a lot of stuff didn't make sense, and then once I started to like kind of whatever, then Keith, you know the funny thing was Keith would kind of like even when I quit at the very 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 end. You know, I, I was basically saying, you know, you guys force us to take vacations and we, we don't get paid. Like that's not a vacation. That's right, not a vacation right. when, when you're, when you close the, the offices and then we, we can't, we can't get paid. And, and then, you know, if we have another show, that's fine. But it's, it was just, and then Keith goes, well, we'll pay you, we'll pay you, you know? So I was like, we'll pay you for vacation. So, so I'm like, so why don't you just, what, 
So I got to complain to get any results here. Yeah. Why do I have to go through this to get to something? Yeah. Like like I have to go like I'm quitting and he's like, well, what's the problem? Like, well, yeah, well, partly this, but with Bill Schultz, when, um, I mean, I think they, when they first hired Bill Schultz, their thing was Keith. I mean, Gavin recommended him and, and then they thought, you know, since Bill was from Fox news, he would do like a political stuff like Gavin Mm -hmm. And then, then it didn't work out that way. So then they brought in Joanne to make it more like, like a, like a morning show, like a, like a, like a, they were supposed to be ironic to like mm. the a typical morning show with a man and a woman anyway. But it, I, I just wish, cause even when, even when, um, they hired Artie, um, me and Gino Bisconti both said like, that's, that's not, cause that was right after Artie went after me on good Friday. Mm. So, uh, we were like, that's, you know, Artie's, Artie's not a good hire. He's not, a, you know, I, you know, no. Artie's not for four days a week. That's not a good. And like, if you want to bring him in one day a week, bring him in one day a week to start him at four days a week. Same thing with Bill Schultz, like bring him in one day a week, see how he does and, and blah, blah, blah. But, but they, you know, so we didn't sit in at the meetings and the, you know, the one thing I'll say in Keith's defense, he's not a comic. He doesn't, mm. he doesn't know, like he knows what he knows. He's, he doesn't go to comedy clubs. He doesn't know, like his, he doesn't know as much as he thinks he does. And, and either does, either does Kumia probably, Kumia has probably got knows more about it, but like, so they would hire people that just, you know, Artie's not like highly respected in the comedy world. Like he was, but you know, mm. once he got out of trouble and then once he was, a, I mean, like, they hire Artie and they're paying him a lot of money. Like I've turned, I found out how much money he was getting when they started. He was pay, getting a lot of money. And anybody was like, why are you paying him this much money? He's not getting any other offers. Like you're competing. <laughs> like when the Yankees overpay somebody by, by $30 million, like you're competing against nobody. Like nobody else is trying to hire Artie Lang. So yeah, you're negotiating you can against pay, yourself. Yeah. You can pay him basically pennies and he'll probably take it. And then if he, and then if he does well from there, hmm. then give him more money, but don't start him high and, and pun intended. Don't start him high. <laughs> And then be like, oh, we, yeah, of course you paid him too much because he had no other offers. Yeah, just put an eight ball on his seat every morning. He'll, he'll turn. I up. mean, even from the beginning, I guess he got high the first show he was there with, with uh, I guess Voss was there and he already nose was bleeding. Yeah, yeah, he'd go to the bathroom, <laughs> and come back, and his nose started gushing with blood. Was, uh... one, time he went to the, one time he went to the bathroom and then he never came back. <laughs> <laughs> he called... He went to a hotel and he called Keith. He goes, "Can I do the show from here?" <laughs> I just picked. Now that's a hand. good. That's a good story. Artie would never tell that side, that version of that story. But yeah, no. but they they were good. They doesn't paint you know, in the best light, does it? I mean, it's it's funny. It's like it's funny if you're not paying them. I mean, if yeah. you're paying them not a lot of money, it's funny. Like you don't care. But if you're paying them a lot of money, and then uh, and things aren't going good then then it looks kind of dumb so and the, the i don't think the bill schultz thing ever because they <laughs> i'm such a dick but anyway they have a they have a they have they started a youtube page joanne and bill yeah and and like you can it's pretty easy to find but you just go there and they 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 have like 182 views and you just like mm. come on just stop just stop like you're just embarrassing yourself like just don't just just close it up close up shop your yeah. youtube page is not working like the, sh- the show i'm sure people think it's fine but i don't it's not like people are excited to watch it be like oh you know kids shh, shh. <laughs> mom's gonna watch a morning show with bill and joanne so yeah um if anthony had offered you second mic at any point would you have, would you have taken that who if anthony had offered you second mic um yeah whether... because yeah well to be honest when i was when he was when he uh i just started there i just started there like in mm. march of 2017 and and the already thing started in that summer like i because i remember we did a show in in uh long island and keith was saying to me and gino that or i overheard keith talking to gino about something and right. Gino's like I I think I remember Gino going like I don't know I don't I don't know so I said what was that about and Keith is like yeah I think we're gonna bring in Artie full time mm. so I texted so I was sorry I was like I go 
I was like, oh, really? I go, I don't know about it. So I, I think I said something there. And the next day I texted Keith. I said, I said, well, you know, let me throw my hat in the ring for the co-host job because, you know, I'll, I'll work for less and I do a lot less heroin than Artie. <laughs> you know? So not, not none, but definitely less. Yeah. Yeah. So, <laughs> so still Keith, a bit. Keith was like, ha, ha, ha. So then, uh, and then, and then, um, and then I think Bobby, I saw Bobby somewhere. He goes, why don't, why don't they make you his uh, uh, Kumia sidekick? I would, you know, I, I know why he didn't take me because it's like, you know, I'm, you know, they, you know, whatever. Yeah, but after, I, what, I, after all the stuff Anthony's been through with his, with his co-hosts, I mean, even the Dave Landau thing recently, he'd do, a, he'd do a lot worse than bring you on now, I think, as a, I mean, not to preempt your, what, what you're going to do, but I feel like now would be an incredibly good time to bring you on board um in a much more i know that you left in acrimonious circumstances but i think i think at this point you know honestly i think that at this point i i don't even think he's gonna get a sidekick because i think he like he tried it he like the arty thing was such a fiasco and then the landau thing you know it calm it, it calmed the waters the fans liked landau uh he was the like i told kumia last week he was he's the anti arty lang he shows up on time uh, he doesn't talk over everybody and he doesn't do heroin. So, so he checked all the boxes and, but I think with the Lana thing, I think he's kind of like, all right, do I even need a sidekick? Do I need, do I need to go through this shit anymore? And then he, right. you know, he's thinking about moving to South Carolina. So I don't think he's going to want to have a sidekick down there. Cause then it's just, I think it's just, I think when it comes to it, when it gets down to it, I think it'll just eventually end up just being how it started with just Anthony at a mic at his house, you know, and then, I think and so, then, yeah. cause that's what people, there. I mean, that's why people sign up in the first place and, you know, and people, people are there for Anthony anyway. So I don't mm. think, I don't think it's gonna, he's going to lose a lot of people if it's just him and then people call in or, or whatever. But at this point, at this point for me, I, you know, if I, I would, I would like, I mean, I'm just, I was a little, sometimes I get a little something where I'm like, I, I you know, it would, that's why it was fun to go in last week to do the show because, mm. you know, I got, I get, I, cause it was fun to have the job there until, you know, until it stopped making sense. Um, yeah. Moving on to Dave Landau though. So he's a relatively unknown Midwestern comedian and he's suddenly thrusted into uh, Ant's sort of second mic following a number of sycophantic guest appearances on his part. So what did you make of the decision at the time? <laughs> um, I remember I told Keith when they hired him, I said, and I think I, I, I can send you the email, but I said, uh, fuck you for hiring Dave Landau. <laughs> and Keith said, he said, well, it was, it was it's the boss's decision. So, I mean, I, I didn't know it was, I didn't know it was, um, it was i didn't know it was a foregone conclusion like when i had a fight with him on jim and sam i didn't know he was or basically he was already hired to be the third mic at that point i didn't know that so so as that was playing out i mean looking back i didn't care because that was all good that was when bernie bridges really started to fucking get good when i was like fighting with people on the show mm -hmm. and and then they gave me two days a week and then Lando got hired. So it created a lot of whatever. So I, at that point I was like, I couldn't give two fucks about the show. And I think that's when the show got better. Cause I just didn't, I would say anything. I would go after Keith. I would say anything about anybody on the show. I basically wouldn't say anything about Kumi cause I liked him and I, you know, Kumi's funny. So, hmm. and plus he was always right after me. Like he would, his show would follow my show on Monday and or Wednesday. So uh, I like, really shit on him because he was sitting in the green room eating his lunch. So uh, no, but so I just thought like looking back, I was like, yeah, it was a turbulent time for the net for compound media and me, but it created like a lot of whatever for me, a lot of momentum, like a, yeah. a lot of comedy momentum. And then that's when, that's when I think the show got really good because and then Brian McCarthy started to come on more and then he became my regular. And then it became like a goofy kind of, uh, like, uh, like I forget that show with Martin Mull and, uh, firmware tonight it became like a firmware tonight kind of a thing where like, I was like the caustic host and then my, my idiot drunk sidekick. And, uh, but I was, <laughs> yeah. but I was, but I was so mad, like so many. And I was like, I would get mad at Michael Malice. I would just get mad at like everybody. One time I did a show, and 
I said to Garrett, I go, Garrett, how long do I got to do to get paid? He goes, an hour. Because <laughs> I was supposed to do an hour and a half. He goes, an hour. I go, okay, we're done. And I remember Brian's, Brian's like, what are you doing? <laughs> and then Brian goes, should I sit in for the next half hour? And Garrett goes, no, 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 you're not the host. You're the sidekick. So it was just, it was like complete shit show. But it was like, I knew at the time, I'm like, this is funny. Like, the, that's, mm. this is what the fans want. They want fucking yeah. chaos, you know? Exactly. So when they hired, when they hired Landau, you know, he had, he, he had said he's going to, you know, ha- he wanted to have sex with my daughter when she was 18. And, on the Jim and Sam. And then I said, as you know, I said something about his wife. I, I didn't even say his wife was fat. I just, I, I said, probability, the probability is that she's fat because you're, you're overweight. She's fat. And all, and all Midwestern women are fat, like not all, but 95% of Midwestern women are overweight. So I just prob like the probability was that she was overweight. So, so he got real. So it just, it was never it, it, like, so I was never a fan of his. And then I thought he was getting way too much, way too many accolades for being mm-hmm. a sidekick because it's not a hard gig. I mean, Artie made it look difficult, but it's not a hard gig. No, I think I, I feel like from our perspective, there's a bit of buttering up from Dave to, to sort of get there. It was very much, you know, um, I, I, like I said, it, it felt a little sycophantic from his yeah yeah well i think that's what i think kumi at that point didn't have a problem with that i think he like i think he liked the fact that like you know landau wouldn't cause him any problem because he was grateful for the job and i think Mm. landau can does ingratiate himself to people not to me but you know i think you know hires up and he's he's a he kisses he kisses people i don't know if he kisses people ass but I, i somehow he tricked kumi into thinking that he was like some kind of great commodity so have you seen, by the way, oh. that they've taken away uh, the Jim and Sam show have, have removed the video of your and Dave Landau's fight? I can't seem to track it anywhere. I know it's it was uh, it was up, it was uh, it was up, then it was not up, then it was up again, and then and now I can't find it. Is it so, a liability uh, thing from Sirius, perhaps? Or? No, because I, I it's really weird. It's really weird. I, maybe they just take. I don't know. I have no idea. I have it on audio. I taped it on my phone because whenever I do Jim and Sam, I tape it on my phone in case mm. just in case something I want to hear something that I said because you know yeah if so there's I material listen- in there or something yeah and I listened to it the other day and it's brutal like it's fucking <laughs> brutal like it, it was it's- hilarious I mean uh, I mean I mean I was saying it, it, we were f- like at one point I said you know the fat Joe I was calling him fat he goes you're fat. <laughs> and uh, and I was skinny. I've been my skinny my whole life, you know. And I was like, it was like it was like he was like a fifth creator. I mean, I'm not saying I was that much better, but and then at one point, I go, nobody even knows who you are. He goes, nobody knows who you are either. I go, so I looked at Norton. I go, Jim, you know who I am? He goes, yeah. So I look at Sam. I go, Sam. He goes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so whatever I would say to him. He would throw it back and be like, "Well, you don't know. Nobody knows you either." I'm like, "No, everybody knows me. Like, especially in New York, yeah. and I've been on the show enough. And I already, I have my show. I do, I do You've my got show. Got a lot in- of credit in the bank up until that point. I mean, Dave Lundell yeah. came from relative nowhere, from Midwestern comedy, to to sort of be thrust into this world all of a sudden. And, and I think that he, because he had already got the job, that I didn't know that, that he was probably like feeling it, feeling his oats. And he was like, well, mm. well, Kumi and Keith the Cop have my back. And so it was, it was weird. It was weird. He, he's just, he's a weird little dude, in my opinion. So people think he's like this great something, this great comic. He, people, he's a great comic. I'm like, compared to who? Like compared to Louis C.K., compared to David Tell, like, I'm, t- I'm not even talking about I'm not picking out these names because mm. um, these are famous comics it's like I, this, is, this is who I started with at Boston Comedy Club Nick DiPaolo yeah. Louis C.K. David Tell so it's like well this is and, the new then, benchmark now isn't it, it, it the, the the current roster of, of sort of new up and coming comedians right now um, I mean feel free to disagree with this obviously you're in the industry but from a comedy fans perspective it's it's really been a huge drop off from from the days of of yourself and louis ck and people of that stature i don't know i don't, I, don't, I, mean, I mean these guys sell a lot of fucking tickets so i like you know yeah but I tiktok's mean, I, popular at the moment as well so it's, yeah no you're I mean, right but i'm saying like I, i'm just saying for i listen i i sh- 
sometimes I'll go after the I mostly went after the younger guys because they were complaining that you know if they if they didn't get a fucking if they had to stay at the La Quinta Inn instead of the Marriott so I was like listen man Man. I was like, don't complain about this shit. You're lucky you're at a hotel. We used to we used to stay at condos. We used to fucking make no money. We didn't have mm-hmm. the internet. We didn't have podcasts. We you had to, you had to make all your money through stand up. It was. It, I'm just. I'm not saying like I'm not. I'm not looking for sympathy. I'm just saying like it's a different kind of a. Uh, it's you know co- comedy is very corporate right now and yeah. and or it was before the pandemic. But I'm saying like I'm just saying like I like I don't even think. Like, like, it's not like when I was working with Louis, when Louis first started, I was like, I just always, Louis was always a good comic and, and, and Nick DiPaolo was a great comic when he started. Mm. And, and yeah, I mean, some of his early and, stuff was like, I really like it. No, but I mean, I mean, when Nick, Nick was like 25, he would just fucking kill every show. And I was like, what, where are these fucking, and then Louis was always, Louis had always like all kinds of material. And it was like, and it was like, and so I was always like, jesus christ and they would tell like i was like me and tell were like best friends for 10 years and mm. tell would say just talk just hanging out with them Tell would just say hilarious stuff you know and yeah. so so i was never as good as them like I, i'm i'm the first one i'm in and like i was never as good as louis i was never as good as DePaulo. i was never mm. as good as Tell. but like this is who i started with so so when they say landau i'm like i'm like Lando, are you? F- and then I saw him. Like they, I saw. I did. Mm. I was on a show with him. So, and he was fine. But he's not Louis C.K. So, yeah. so, you know. And 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 it's not like he's new. He's been doing it long enough. So this whole thing is like the guy's great, and you're bitter. And it's like, I'm not okay. Maybe I'm bitter, but he's not great. No, no. I mean, I can agree with you there. We used to call him Dave Landcow on his uh, on the old subreddit. Um, but yeah, just going on to um, Gary Gorman, who's another of oh, God. our favourites here. So you were physically assaulted by him in the bathroom of, was it the Village Underground? Yes. Um, so what exactly <laughs> did you say to him to elicit that kind of a reaction? He was, um, oh God, this is so crazy. Um, so, uh, so about January... January sometime he was doing a he was on a show he was on the show at the Village Underground I was on after him it was just like a Monday show or whatever it was a weekday show not a big deal and um, so he's doing some joke about he goes you know the worst thing about he's making fun of Dave Chappelle Dave Chappelle always slaps the mic on his on his uh, on his leg mm. when, when Dave says something funny he like he's like I'm so funny even I make myself laugh and he'll slap the mic on his leg. So he did that. And then he goes, and then he goes, the worst thing about Dave Chappelle is he gave us uh, Neil Brennan. <laughs> okay, so the crowd doesn't even know who Neil Brennan is. I mean, I don't know what the, I don't know. Again, I'm not being bitter. I'm just saying there was no reaction. The crowd doesn't know who Neil Brennan is, but I'm next. My name's Kevin Brennan. So the crowd's going to, the crowd's probably going to make some kind of connection with that because it was at the end of his set anyway. Sam Morell, who, I'm not even really friends with. He's friends with Goldman. He comes up to me, and goes, "Does he know you're next?" I go, "I don't know what the fuck he knows." But um, so I didn't say it. So you know, I'm not, I can't do really do anything then because I got to go up next. So I went up, did my show, um, and I'm like, "Yeah, that's a that's a fucking dick move." And then and then um, so then um, yeah, then then like a month later. He he was doing that. He was doing tweets like comedy tips. He did the comedy tip tweet every day for for the whole year of whatever year that was, twenty nineteen, I guess. And uh, so it was Valentine's Day. I was actually supposed to be in Chicago with Louis. I was opening for Louis, but Louis canceled like last minute because uh, something I forget what happened. But so I was like annoyed that I was like, and I had to buy my wife, uh, you know. <laughs> instead of being in Chicago making money and, mm. and sending her flowers from Chicago, like all dramatically, like a fucking Cary Grant movie. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I was, you know, I was, I was in New York. It was fucking cold out. I was going to have to uh, buy flowers and chocolates and schlep them home. Mm. And, um, and then, uh, you know, whatever. So I was annoyed. So 
so he tweet he in one his valent saint valentine or his, his valentine's day tweet i retweeted it and said the dirty little secret about gary goldman is he's a he's a violent man he berates waitresses and and you know he is i wasn't exaggerating really but so then um i didn't see him for a long time after that and then i saw him uh like i saw him in like about a month later at the comedy cellar he was going on he was on before me he probably i guess he obviously knew i was on next so i was walking through the bathroom to go to you have to walk through the room to go to the bathroom mm. so i was walking through the room he stops the show and stares at me which no one's ever done before or since like you might make fun of the guy walking through but you never right. stop and stare at the guy he didn't talk and i could see everybody looking at me i just kept walking i'm like i don't know so i so then i come out of the bathroom he does it again he stops doesn't and again, he wouldn't do that if unless he was six six, because it's like he doesn't have to worry about hecklers because somebody heckles him, will you know, beat him up or whatever. But he's a bully anyway. So I walk through, stops again, and then uh, then when he when he can't see me anymore, walking through, walking in front, because in the comedy cellar, the 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 pathway is like really close to the stage. It it you know it can if if a bunch of people walk through, mm. it does kind of interrupt the show a little bit. But but he literally stopped to just stare at me like to like like i see you i'm gonna fuck you up whatever you know but it was just so odd anyway so he finishes i'm going up next the mc doesn't know anything so i'm waiting to go up i'm like to the side i'm waiting for him to like introduce me gary comes up puts out his hand to shake my hand and I, and i like i guess i put out my hand i don't know what the fuck anyway so i start shaking my hand squeezing it harder and harder I'm like this guy's a fucking idiot so so then i go up i have kind of a rattled set because i actually kept my my um back my coat on and and my jacket and my backpack i mean so i could make a quick getaway <laughs> 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 so i brought up all my stuff i brought up my wife and kids on stage no i mean i brought up my i usually don't have a big jacket and a backpack but i was like i better get ready in case this guy for, you didn't I don't wear your backpack the, during your set did you no, I just put it in near the oh, piano. Okay. <laughs> so then I, so then I get, so, and I, and I was planning on, there's a side door at the cellar, like an emergency door. But so I, mm. so I did my set, left, went upstairs. And then, cause I, I figured Gary Gum would be waiting for me upstairs. And I was like, I'm getting the fuck out. I had a long day. I did you know, what anyway, I did my show, my compound media show that day. And anyway, so then I, so then I did, I went on Jim and Sam and like, it's, you know, maybe I shouldn't have done it, but I was talking about that, what Gary Goldman did. And maybe Sam brought it out of me because he likes the Sam's into, you know, Sam's into wrestling. So yeah, I think he yeah. likes, <laughs> I did a documentary on. Sam's no, I know. I was just watching. I was just watching it. I didn't know he's such a freak about food, eating food. Yeah. Yeah. He can't eat steak. It's very, it's weird, fucking, very weird. Yeah. It's fucking it's ridiculous. He was, he was fed baby food until he was like 18. I know, but that's crazy. I had no idea. Jeez. I was watching this. I was like, I, I was getting sick watching him throw up fucking steak. <laughs> <laughs> so uh so i was talking about it on jim and sam like a couple weeks after he shook my hand i was just saying like he shook my hand started to squeeze it like i was gonna like, like he's the incredible hulk or something i don't know what the fuck anyway so so i i do that on like on a tuesday the following friday i go to the cellar or i'm at the village underground i'm next uh i'm just in the bathroom there's a bathroom with a with a bathroom attendant gary goldman rushes in grabs me throws me up against the wall and uh and the bathroom attendant and he knows both of us he knows we're both comics so he's like hey break it up break it up and then and then one of the bouncers came in and broke it up but mm -hmm. gary goldman just he didn't i don't think he said anything but he had like a first he would looked mad then he had like that that weird smile like the like a like like a like a like you know like like a, a like if you're trying to be a sinister character and like instead of scaring scare have a scary face then you have that like crazy smile like in like, like sinister in a, so yeah what's that what's that movie I just, what's the movie that they did where the guys uh, Gary Gummel was in it where the guy played the um uh what's his what's his face what's that movie where he was uh he he did he did stand up comedy 
Joe, what's that fucking? No you can cut all this out. The guy from yeah. the the I don't know if it's the, the Joker it was the Joker. Oh, Joker, yeah, yeah. Who's the who's the star of the Which Joker? Joaquin Phoenix. Yeah, Joaquin. I can't say his name. My wife loves him, but yeah, I was gonna say Joaquin. <laughs> Joaquin. <laughs> I can't. I know. I if I don't hear it, I don't. I still. I always forget how to pronounce it. Anyway, it was like that where he's trying to like he's like. He had that sinister smile on his face, like yeah. look, look how crazy I am. And I was just like, get the fuck away from me. So, <laughs> so then, and I was on next. So, yeah. so the manager goes, and then Liz came down. You know, who used to be on my podcast. She's mm-hmm. the general manager, and she's like, what the fuck did you do? I go, I he did it. So, uh, so then they're like, are you going to go on? I go, I'm not going on. Like I just mm-hmm. had a fucking a gigantic Jew try to um try to he threw me up against the wall so um so i didn't go on and then they go so i'm then i'm done for the night so i'm like i'm i'm just gonna leave and then the bouncer goes let's go up the back way because gary goldman's up he's upstairs mm-hmm. so i'll have to walk by him so i said no 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 because i heard him laughing so i walked upstairs and um so I walked by him. He said something to me. I said something to him. And then he came, he rushed at me again. And then, um, so then I said, so I was going to go home. I said to Liz, I go, no, let me go talk to Noam. Cause I know if I don't give my side of the story, Noam's the owner of the comedy. Yeah. So I, I know if I don't give my side of the story, I, I can only imagine what SD who's the manager is going to hear. So I give my side of the story. Uh, with Noam and Liz sitting there. And then I said, yeah, I said, I basically told Noam, I go, yeah, it started with him doing a, he's shitting on Neil right mm-hmm. before I go up. I go, the crowd doesn't even know who Neil is. So I'm like, what is he trying to accomplish? Like, and then, and I said, and Liz goes, yeah, it was a bit he was working on. So it was just a, so I'm like, that's a bit. It's like not even a bit. And so <laughs> I'm like, it's a, and, and Noam was like, yeah, it's kind of a weird bit to be doing about, Dave Chappelle, who works here, and then you're next. So he was kind of sympathetic to me. Um, but, you know, I told, like I told Noam, I said, Noam, listen, I know you're Jewish. I know Gary Goldman's Jewish. I know how the tribunal is going to uh, <laughs> side on this one. So, yeah. <laughs> so Noam was like, Noam goes, Noam goes, are you serious? I go, come on, Noam. I go, the Irish were not like that, but I know, I know you guys are good with each other. So I <laughs> thought that was the most outrageous thing. No good. No was like laughing, but thought also yeah. thought I was crazy. I'm like, no, I don't expect you to side with me. I just wanted you to hear my side of the story. So, but, but by, the bottom line is the bottom line in all of this is like, I don't like, I don't, I'm not lying. Like I'm I didn't lie about Gary Goldman. So when, when Liz said, um, you know, yeah, it's, it was a bit he was working. I'm like, well, I thought he was just made that up that night, but he's, it's a dumb bit, whatever. But it's the same thing with Lenny. Like, I don't, I'm not making this stuff up. I'm just saying like, this is what these guys are. Like Gary Goldman is a bully. He's a mean Mm -hmm. bully. He yells at waitresses. He's like, everybody has a Gary Goldman is a bully story, or they've heard of Gary Goldman as a bully story. They don't hear stories about me being a bully or Dan Natterman, who's like, you know, 120 pounds wet. So, but Gary Goldman's a big dude and he uses that to intimidate people. And I was like, I'm not gonna be fucking intimidated by this guy, you know? So he's like, well, and then to prove that he's not a violent guy, he throws me up against the wall at the bathroom at the Village Underground. Yeah. So I'm like, touche, right? I mean, I, I like said what, you're violent. I, like I said, said you're violent. You, you said uh, huh? you've, you failed the test or <laughs> What did I say? When uh, Gary Gorman said, don't test me, and you said, I already oh, did, yeah. and you failed. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, that's what he said. I forgot what he said. I knew he said something before that wicked smile he gave me, but he goes, don't <laughs> hey, he goes, don't test me. I, I'm like, you already, you already failed. Because he, that's the way I looked at it. He was like, I said you're, he's a violent guy, and to prove that yeah. I'm – to try to, I don't know, to prove that I'm right. He throws this essentially. Yeah, he throws me up against the wall. I was like, wow, this guy's stupid. And it didn't, only took three it took three days after I was on a radio. Yeah, didn't and I he, could um, hear him. I could hear him complaining to Esty because he came in after me, and right. then he was he went to the comic. He went to the comics table at the comedy cellar, and he was. I could hear him telling Esty like he's talking about me on the radio. It's like, come on, man. <laughs> and that's what I'm saying. Like, 
you know, comics are such babies compared, you know, rappers, mm-hmm. they, they shoot each other and they fucking, I mean, comics are like, he's, he was talking about me on the radio. Yeah, but you're not dead. Could you imagine back in the old days, the ONA days with, oh my you know, God. the comedy cellar table with the likes of Patrice and, and who else was there? Could you imagine them moaning about who, what someone said on Opie and Anthony? I mean, yeah. I mean, it's, it's just, it's mine. But I mean, the thing is that with those guys mostly went after each other. I right, mean, right. I mean, I mean, the one thing I'm doing is like, I, I, but again, if I interact with the guy and then, you know, I don't have to be friends with the guy to have an opinion about the guy. So right, it's, right. And if Gary Goldman's going to talk shit about, you know, people be like, Oh, you don't even like your brother. It's not, even if I, that's beside the point. If he's talking shit about my brother, and he's saying Neil Brennan. The crowd doesn't even know who he is. Don't bring up my brother's name before I go on. I mean, yeah. And basically, I think Noam said to him, "Just don't do the bit anymore." It's, it's like, don't be talking about her. You know. And the crowd it's, doesn't. The crowd knows Dave Chappelle. They don't know Neil Brennan. Well, it's less about what he's saying specifically about Neil Brennan. It's more that he's doing it before you go on. It's making a statement, basically. He's I guess he's making a point, isn't he? He's, he's trying to flex or something. I thought it was odd. I thought it was very odd. That's why even Sam Morell's like, he knows you're next. I'm like, I don't know what he knows. You know? But again, he if he wasn't big, he wouldn't try this shit. You know? Didn't he try and uh, label you racist and anti-Semitic at some points as well? Where he did that where? On his show? Um, I think I remember I was, I was in preparation for this interview. I went through some of, um, I think it was on Burning Bridges. And I think you made uh, a couple of sort of statements about the fact that he uh, did label you as sort of anti-Semitic and racist, called you a racist comedian. Um, and I think that ties into, I, th- I remember you talking about a certain list um, of of, co- of problematic comedians, of comedians that were like, you know, racist or any of that stuff. And I was just really, obviously being in the comedic circuit, like, is that something you're seeing a lot more of? Um, stuff that, that during the o, the O and A days, that race was a topic, uh, not not necessarily a taboo topic of comedic conversation, but nowadays it it seems like it's you, that we're getting a lot more comedians that are, that are being sort of labelled as as racist, misogynistic, anti-Semitic. I guess. I mean, it, it, you know, I mean, with me, it's hard because uh, you know my wife's. Of, of of color, <laughs> of color. <laughs> no, I mean that's what women say. We W O C, woman of women of color. Yeah. So, my wife's Panamanian. I mean, she grew up here. She's from the Bronx. But I mean, so it's like, I mean, I have a little bit of protection with that. That right. You know, if I do jokes about race, it's like I'm not racist. I mean, if my wife was white and I do jokes about race about people of color, am I racist? I don't know. I mean, it, you know, it's like, shouldn't, it's like, shouldn't you, a comedian be able to do it regardless of, but it's, you know, it's like the old thing where like, if you're Jewish, you can make Jewish jokes. If you're black, you can make black jokes. So you got to mm. tread, you got to tread lightly. I don't just because my, my wife is black, is blackish, yeah. but, but like, and the anti Semitism, it's like, um, I mean, that's easy to, I mean, I'm not anti Semitic. I no, mean, of course not. I mean, <laughs> I mean, it's like, I, I mean, I don't listen. I don't even know how to explain it. It's like when you work in, in stand up, it's like a lot of people they are Jewish, you know, and like, and a lot of times you don't even know they're Jewish. And then, and then you're like, Oh, he's Jewish. Or you will look up his Wikipedia. And it's like, he's Jewish. Hmm. And then you're like, Oh, okay. So, but like my best friend was David tell for 10 years. Like, I never like if I was anti-Semitic, I don't think I would have been friends with the guy. Like, wouldn't sure. I had a pro? Wouldn't I had a? I mean, I'm just saying logically, would I would I have had a problem with David Tell if I was anti-Semitic? So, like, I, that never factors into like who I like and who I don't like. Like, if the guy's funny, I mm-hmm. like him. So, so the Gary Goldman thing. Gary Goldman's very defensive about being Jewish. I think just because. You know, he he went to he was he's a football player and he was you know he. There's not a lot of Jews who play football, so he might have got a lot of, you know, anti-Semitic uh, comments, and so he and but he's he does a lot of bits about, you know, defending Jewish people and Jew. That's fine. I don't give a shit. So if he wants to say I'm anti-Semitic because because I'm not because I stood up to him or because I said what he did, mm. so it's like so that's the double standard of like. If I don't like somebody who's black, am I racist or is that guy an asshole? Right, right. 
So so if you're black, nobody can not like you because yeah. they're, that makes them racist. If, if you're Jewish and somebody doesn't like you, they're anti-Semitic. No, maybe you're a jerk off. <laughs> so so that's my point. Like yeah. like Gary Goldman, you know, I mean, if you ask Noam, Noam's Jewish. If you ask Noam from the, I mean, I made that joke with Noam because I'm a comic. I mean, I said that about Noam, about how the chi- tribunal is going to decide this one, <laughs> you know, basically because I know Jewish people are more, uh, uh, whatever the word is, they're like Italians where they like, they, they, they like, they, they protect each other and yes. they, they, they form like a, they, like w- whatever, a, a what thing? I've got like an in group of, you know. Yeah. But it's like the, the Irish aren't like that. The Irish don't congregate and, and like, like Italians right. do the, the ca- Italians are more close knit than the Irish historically, I would say. And Jewish people definitely, they, in New York, they still live in like well, not Williamsburg mm. or Crown Point or whatever. The point is that that like I said that to Noam as a joke, but also as a fact. You right, know, right. I mean, I don't get along with most of the people in my family. Let alone do we all <laughs> live together and five generations of Brennans living in the same mm. fucking house. You know, but my point is that like that like if uh, like I should be allowed to not like black people or not like Jewish people or not like. Uh, italian people if they're fucking assholes so it's it's so it's a so if you know if somebody's if even if a woman says something like if i don't like a woman then i'm a misogynist it's like how about she's a cunt you know (laughs) so uh so like if 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 something happens in the audience and the the guy's black or it's a woman or whatever then you got to be careful because it automatically becomes a racial situation or so so um Goldman wears the, you know, I'm a Jew thing on his sleeve. And he has for years that, you know, if you, if, you know, don't, I don't want to hear any anti-Semitism, but he's very defensive about it, which is, I don't give a shit. It's like be defensive. And he probably thinks I'm the biggest Jew in the world. So I got to stand up for all the non big Jews or whatever. Yeah. And uh, maybe he does, maybe he does, but, uh, but you know, I, but if I don't like him and he's a Jew, am I an anti-Semitic? I don't think so. No. No, uh, it, it's I only touched on it just because it's. Um, no, I'm 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 not talking to you. I'm talking to the people listening. No, <laughs> <laughs> I'm but, trying to persuade them. I'm trying to make my case. No, I just sometimes feel like that's an easy out for you know, not necessarily just Jewish people, just any interest group that that uses it exactly. as a protective. They use it as a protective cloak almost to, to right. You know, uh, yeah. So moving away from Jews. <laughs> um, <laughs> Back to Compound Media. Now, you you uh you left Compound Media under very, I mean, funny but strange circumstances. Um, was uh, given Anthony's reassurance that the network were looking to give you more days. Um, were you convinced by that, uh, or do you regret your decision looking back to not maybe hold out and see if Anthony's promise was was going to um was going to flourish? Um, you know. I just actually watched a clip the other night because I was watch- I was actually watching some of your stuff with the um, I watched the Matt Reese and then yeah. I actually watched Norton oh, yeah. <laughs> talking about I actually watched Norton talking about the documentary about him and uh, and Norton I mean Norton was funny he was he was actually you know it's not all true but it was it definitely made me laugh <laughs> <laughs> so that was a that was a real fucking I thought for you it was like a four star review you know the guy you made it about was actually saying yeah watch it it's funny so um, so I actually watched a clip of uh, Keith the Keith Maresca as you call him Keith Maresca and uh, Anthony Cumia mm when the day I, the day, the first day that I quit, you know, and uh, I mean, I felt kind of bad. I really felt bad because, you know, what, and I was saying on my show the other day, Kumia got all everything right. Like he called me, he texted me. I told, texted him, I call him back. I didn't call him back. Anyway, long story short, I did feel bad. I tried to talk myself out of quitting. I really was like, don't quit. It's fun to have the job there, but there was just too many it was like one of those things where i compared to like having a girlfriend Mm. that you kind of like but you're kind of like this is this is like a this is a pain in my ass and and then like maybe the sex is good or maybe some maybe she's a good cook i don't Mm. even know but but you just know long term it's like it's kind of a not a 
not a great situation for you. So I could have done, I, I could have done it better, but you know, that's really not my style at this point. Right. So, um, and you know, I did give them opportunities. You know, I went back to fucking, they quit. I quit on Thursday. They, on Monday, Keith and Anthony were talking about it. And then I went back on Tuesday. I basically went to the studio on Tuesday uninvited. I said I was going to call in. I showed up. So I made my case. I presented mm. why I, what the problems were there. And they were like, okay. And they agreed with me, but they never said like, Let, let's make this right. They were, they were like, you know, so I think it comes down to people are there for Kumia. If you want to stick around, stick around, but we're not going to, we're not going to break the bank. Mm. And, uh, and, and, but the bottom, the really the bottom line was, it's like, it's like not enough people watch it, you know, like it's frustrating that you do with the show and you're doing funny shows there. Mm. I mean, also one of the reasons you can do funny shows because you figure no one's watching and then you just do whatever the fuck you want and then it ends up being like comedy gold or whatever. So, but then you do it and then, then you do live shows and it's like the same fans are there and they're like, oh, how many people watch this fucking network? And then, <laughs> And then, and then Keith, since, you know, I would say it's a cult, so they're never going to tell you the, the numbers, you know, because mm. they don't want you to know. But then I was like, people don't want, I mean, either people don't watch it or they don't come to the shows or they're all lone wolves that don't, that don't want to go to a show by themselves. I, I couldn't figure it out, but I was like, I, I, I just, I was like, I can't, I, like, I, I just, I, there was too many things. There was too many things going wrong there. Mm. I just, I just had it. Like, again, I didn't want to quit because it was like, you know, they weren't going to fire me. I told Keith, just fire me. He goes, I'll, I'm not, gonna. <laughs> I want to be like, I want to get fired. Cause I'm like, cause then people be like, how crazy is this motherfucker that Kumia yeah. fired him, you know, <laughs> for being difficult. There's a guy who got fired from Sirius for all the, yeah. and there's, and they just got arrested. They just took his guns away. Cause he got into a fight with his girlfriend. How mm -hmm. crazy is Brennan? So I thought it'd be really cool if I, they fired me for just being, that would be funny being difficult. So I, it came down to like, and again, I was like, I kept trying. I, even when I quit, I was like, I didn't, I still had like one foot in the door. I showed up that Tuesday. I went mm -hmm. back on Wednesday and I did the show. And then I was just, and then I just kind of was like, I can't do this. And then Keith was, he was a lot of bad blood between me and Keith. Mm -hmm. And I was like, I can only, I, you know, I just thought long term it's going to be a bad situation. Yeah. Sort of cut the cord now before it gets really bad. Yeah, I didn't want to. I didn't want to like. I didn't want to get into a fist fight with Keith or Kumia. Like, I didn't. I don't want to be like that fucking weird. So I'm like, you know. And it wasn't like a, the money was not like enough that the money was not even close to a living wage. So and Keith, mm -hmm. it's like it's a part time job. Okay, it's a part time job, but it's like, I mean, I just figured I'll go off and do what I was doing before I got here and try to you know try to generate and plus i thought like i'm bringing i bring i i was getting in a lot of trouble goldman had just attacked me it was like mm. it was just there was a lot of sh like i was like a i was getting a lot of publicity good and bad and mm. i was like and i'm bill schultz is doing four days a week and I, i'm the one getting all the fucking bringing a, getting publicity at the network and i'm still at two days and i was like and i just thought they're not going to pay me more because you know they're not they're here for kumia they like right. you but they're here for kumia you know yeah. i mean i mean they let they let gavin they let everybody go they let everybody walk yeah they i mean they gavin let walk legion let skanks the skank, there at one point skanks yeah. walk i mean shane gillis was there for a while they, they don't they don't care they're like if you want to leave leave you know mm. even when landau left they're like leave we're not gonna we're not gonna you know they're here for kumia so if you want to leave but i felt bad because i was watching the kumia thing with Keith that, you know, that Monday and, mm. and the shows that shows that's on YouTube and, and Kumi was like, you know, I really like the guy. I like the guy's show. Like he said, I, I follow him on Monday and Wednesday. I'm always listening to it in the, in the green room, laughing my ass off. Yeah. Like we get along and I felt bad cause we did like we, I always, like when we hung out in between shows, we'd always, I, he'd always make me laugh. And I was like, mm. so I felt, yeah, but I just felt like the, the it was almost like the, um, the management like it wasn't as bad as bobby kelly obviously but i was like they, they're not very they're never it's never gonna be great over here because there's just and it, but again if i was making a living wage i wouldn't have left in a million years so sure, if if, sure. if the money was like even 
if for a New York living wage is not like a fortune, but if it was close to a living wage, I would have, I would have never left. I would never even thought about leaving. Mm. Yeah. Um, so on to Dave Landau. Um, so he's, he's obviously now left compound media for Steven Crowder's, uh, louder with Crowder political talk show. Um, what do you think the, were Dave Landau's reasons for leaving? I, <laughs> I think that, um, I don't know. I don't know. But, it, but to, to the point I just made about Kumia rehashing when I left, because mm. people are saying Kumia misunderstood what Lando had said to him. And I, I disagree. Me too. I think, I think Lando, I think Kumia, because when I, I didn't see Monday's show when Kumia was by himself. But when I sat in on Tuesday, the next day, the stuff that Kumi was telling me that happened, I believe that is exactly what happened. And uh, because, like I said, when when he was just when he was going into detail what happened between me and him, he he was exa- he knew exact he got everything exactly right. So when I was looking, when I was thinking, like you know, Lando said, well, maybe we had a misunderstanding. I just think, um, I think he lied to Kumi. Kumi said, "Are they going for you? Are they trying to get you at?" Uh, Crowder and he said no and I think he was just lying because he was probably afraid I think he was probably afraid that if he said yes then Kumia would get pissed Kumia might have said well then get the fuck out of here also then, the Crowder thing might not have been a certainty at that point he might that's not. what I said He it might not have been a sure thing so he was he didn't want to then he'd have no job if, if Kumia mm. said get the fuck out of here and then, then maybe Crowder would have changed his mind who knows but I just think he lied to Kumia and then, because um, I just think Kumi is, you know, people are like, well, Kumi drinks a lot. I'm like, yeah, but he he was drinking when I did the show, and he got everything, every detail exactly right about what happened after I quit. So I just mm. think he he quit, and maybe I don't know what was happening. I don't know what Kumi said to him about leaving New York or any of that. But I just think that Landau probably did lie to Kumi to to cover his ass and then i think he sent the email because i think at that point he was just scared shitless you know he was yeah. like he didn't want to call him or text him because come would be like what the fuck you know mm. well exactly i think in, it, should that confrontation have a, have arisen between lando and kumia um instead of a if it wasn't an email and it was a phone call then surely anthony would have had the question that well two weeks ago you said this was not going to happen exactly and now you now you're leaving so actually you were negotiating behind the scenes and I was in the dark all along. Well, Comey, I wasn't in the dark. I mean, he even said like he got suspicious when he, when he tried to do two weeks mm. or, or he did try to do two out of three weeks doing Crowder and, and uh, he did one week, then he did, then he did one week at Comey in New York. And then he wanted to, he said, is it all right if I go to Texas to do Crowder again? And Comey was like, no, it's not all right. He goes, that's i think that's when he was like are they gunning for you he's like no but you know so i so yeah so that's that's a good point that you just made it's like it's like if uh um if you call a guy or text a guy then then you could say well why'd you lie to me two weeks ago that they were gunning for you you know but if you send a guy email you, you can't really get into a fight over an email because it's not as it's not as uh it's not as instant you know yeah like a, like a text or a conversation and you can just ignore an email. You don't have yeah, to. Yeah, so it's not back and forth like a text or a conversation. Email is not back and forth, and that's why people send them. So yeah, so I was I was happy he was gone because I didn't like him, like I said, and and uh, and I and I, I just thought like I don't know. I was really relieved. It's it was a very odd reaction I had to it because I was very happy. I was surprised because I had heard rumors that he might be leaving. I heard them mm-hmm. from Red Bar. Or somebody said Red Bar. We said he was leaving, and I was like, "There's, I don't think, I, I don't think, I, I was thinking, I don't think he's that dumb. He's not gonna, never gonna have a better job than this." Mm. And um, and Crowder's not a comedy show. I mean, people can say he's a comic, but he's not a fucking comic, you know? Yeah. Um, by the way, as, as far as Red Bar is concerned, is is there something going on between? I've I've not tuned into Red Bar for a, for a short period, so is there something going on between you two? Is there a? I don't know. I've been seeing a couple of clips pop up and. <laughs> Just kind of interested to see what's what's going on there. Listen, I don't. <laughs> I'm not. I don't. I don't even know. Um, 
I like I I, I kind of want to do a show now because, but I don't want to zoom in. Uh, he the last couple of weeks, people saying Red Bar wants you to come on, mm. and I and I was gonna and so I've been I was joking the other day on my show. I said, "You mean his royal His Royal Majesty will see me now?" You know because <laughs> he had been he had been shitting on me a couple of weeks earlier because I guess I said somewhere that. I got stimulus check or I was waiting on a stimulus check. You know, I joke about money all the time. So I'm like, get the, get me that stimulus. And then he was, he was like, this guy's how pathetic is this guy gets the stimulus check. And I'm like, yeah, well I got a family. So should I, should I turn it down? Should I reject it? And uh, so I guess people have, so, but the last two shows, I guess he did, people have been DMing me and saying mm. Red Bar wants you on the show. And I'm like, Yes, your majesty. I will. Like, it was like such an honor. I'm like, the guy's been shitting on me. Now he wants me on. So, and I'm supposed to jump. But I, but I said, like, I just did Kumia show. And I think if I do Kumia, I don't want to pull a land out and do, do, uh, do Kumia show and then be like, hey, now I'm over here at, at Crowder's show. I mean, now I'm over here at Red Bar show. Yeah. I, I didn't want to, I didn't want that to happen. So, um, so, and then I was watching his show and he was shitting on me, but I, it makes me laugh. I'm not going to lie. Like, yeah, I mean, he's he, funny, goes after, like... he goes after Bert, he goes after everybody at compound media and mm. he's kind of like you, like without the accent, but he, he just, he, he, he speaks about them. Um, I don't know, in such a way that always makes me laugh when he talks about Chrissy or <laughs> it's just, I don't know. It yeah. makes me chuckle. So, the show his shows are too long i can't sit through them i can't mm. get through them but but when people send me the clip i watch i'm like it's it's funny so then i thought me and i i would like i would like to go be on a show live just to uh because mm. i just think if if i'm if i'm uh if i'm uh do the show he wants me to skype which i don't even know how to do anymore I just, you know, but, <laughs> I didn't but he wants me to still do that i know but he's always people like red bar wants you to skype in i'm like i don't even know how skype works but then um but I think he'll just be dis. I think he'll shit on me if I Skype in. But if he, mm. if I, if I'm there in person, he can only be so mean to me, you know. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, he used to have a show on on Compound as well, quite famously. Yes. And um, yes, I guess I guess they weren't a fan of his him going after Joe Matteris of all people. Yeah, that was weird, right? Yeah, that's so strange. I mean, to one degree, I can understand it, given that it's from Keith's perspective and not Anthony's and Keith is very much trying to keep you know everybody happy and and trying to make sure that yeah but Matt East didn't have a show there no no he was just a sort of a friend of the show he was um right he was a regular guest that I, I I understand but um yeah he didn't he didn't necessarily have any stake in compound media and, and it seems a bit strange although I think I think part of the bigger reason was that Red Bar was attacking Mike Fenoya who did a yeah he did a burgers and um the finer things show yeah the fine the finer things show yeah um so i think it was that um yeah just no you know what it, you know what it, you know what was odd about it was that keith told me i i never knew anything about mike david or red bar until like really like recently and i got more i had a guest on that was saying red bar said that dave lando was going to leave um Kumi and go to crowder i was like what so I was making fun of, I kept saying, well, you got any more Red Bar news? And um, <laughs> yeah. so I, that got on uh, Red Bar's radar. So he started mm. making fun of me, which I, again, I, I, I'm like him. I, I think it's funny when people make fun of me. But mm. anyway, so, but Keith, when I worked there, when Keith talked about Red Bar, he said, I guess Red Bar, you know, Keith said, you got to lay off other comics. And, and Red Bar said, well, that's what Kevin Brennan does every week. And, Mm. And 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 uh, Keith said, "Yeah, but he's from here and he's been here thirty years, so he's basically, you know, he's basically a made man where you, they don't even know you and you're shitting on everybody." So, so I guess we're kind of connected that way. That he was that that Keith was like, "No, you can't just come in here and shit on Mike Fenoy and Joe Matteris." And mm. Red Bar is probably like, first of all, who cares if I shit on Joe Matteris? He don't even have a show here." And Mike Fenoy had a show there for like three weeks or something, you know. So it wasn't like he was going after uh, Gavin or or Kumia or somebody like that, you know. And I mean, you know, that Anthony now makes fun of Joe Matteris. I mean, he was on Legion of Skanks the other day, and oh, he was. Yeah, they they played my documentary on it, and um, <laughs> because I think that uh, Big J Okerson was was had just seen it. 
and so he he got wait they played the first one or the second one the first joe matt Arise one oh. and um it was it was funny because there were like anthony was there obviously and they were kind of like approaching anthony and they were saying have, have you had any documentaries made on you and obviously there's a beige frequency six hour documentary on anthony Cumia, so um yeah he, he was kind of squirming a little bit but uh yeah so oh, he didn't say yes he didn't say yes he said that um yeah, I think he did say yes eventually. I think initially he said, yeah, there was... Um, I think he misunderstood the question initially, but yeah, oh, I think he did say, right. he did say yes. But, uh, and but they, yeah. watched, they watched his clips of it? No, they just watched the um, the Joe Matteris thing. No, that's what I'm saying. They oh, watched yeah. clips of it or a lot of it? Uh, yeah, just clips. No, uh, but it, it was a fair chunk of the 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 episode was <laughs> was was the documentary and talking about Joe Matarui. So it was just it was funny just going over old ground and and obviously you know Anthony is is you know, he he enjoys making fun of Joe Matarui just as much as anyone else does at this point. <laughs> I gotta watch that now. I gotta watch them. I mean, because uh, um, I was watching. Um, wait, did you make in the second? Oh wait, I saw something where Louis J. Gomez was saying was he was talking about the the Joe Matteris documentary. Was it was that part of this second documentary about Joe Matteris where where Sam was talking about it and then and then Louis J. Gomez was talking about it? Or were they were they independent of that? Um oh bloody hell. I... They both they both <laughs> said the remember. same thing. Uh Louis J. Gomez said something. Maybe he goes, mm. he goes, it's, he goes, it's brutal, but it's funny as shit. And then he and then Sam said the same thing. He goes, yeah, "Oh, the Joe, yeah. the Joe Matteris." He goes, "It's hits." He goes, "It's." <laughs> they both yes, said the same yes, thing. Yes, you, you are right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That that was in the second. The, yeah. The oh second my god! Album. It was just. I mean, to see Lewis just like licking his lips, just mm. saying like, "Just let's put it on." Like he. Well, he yeah. Luckily, I'm. Uh, I am actually just wrapping up now. So uh, I think the last thing I wanted to ask um, was something that I saw you talk about recently about. Um, Apparently, Jim and Sam have had you banned. I don't know if that's um, true or not, but no, it's not true. But it's it's I don't know. I don't even know. It's like uh, I did. I think I did Jim and I did Jim and Sam. Um, I think I did Jim. I did Jim and Sam. I got in a fight with Landau, mm. and then then I got then I did uh, um. Then when I got two days at Compound, which was like uh, May of 2018, then I then I had me on then, and then I was you know I was kind of like in a good mood, so I it wasn't very <laughs> wasn't a very good episode. Yeah, and they kept looking at me like, "Are you gonna start shit?" I was like, "Ah, you know what? I got I just I'm getting two days a week. I'm making some money. You know, I I just I'm gonna be in crash. Like I was like busy and I was making money. I thought like. Hey, you know what? This is actually turning out pretty good. This whole shit on everybody. I'm making some money, and mm. so. Uh, <laughs> but I remember leaving. I was like, "Oh, that was terrible." Like it, it was just because they kept looking at me like, "Are you going to start shit?" Like they didn't say it, but mm. you, you know, tell. when you're in that studio, and I've had some kind of notorious episodes there. So yeah. I'm like, so I'm like, so I even when I left, I was like, ugh. I mean, it wasn't on them; it was on me. And then, and then Brian McCarthy. It was like his wet fucking dream to be on Jim and Sam. So, <laughs> so I think I asked them, "Can I do your show and bring in Brian McCarthy?" And then, and then I think that was like right before that was when I was talking about the Goldman stuff. So mm-hmm. I think that was the last time I was on. And then. Um, yeah and then i think that was that was it but then i've been doing chip a lot lately so yeah so i'm sure i could do it but with this with the zoom it's just i never think about it like i I, you know like like um chad brings it up chad zumach brings it up and then i'm like yeah i should try to get on but so i yeah i might have i have an album that i did i might i might be um hopefully it's coming out Mm. soon and then um called nobody likes you and then uh, and then <laughs> i'll probably plug it on probably plug it on jim and sam so i i don't really it's like the days of like opie like i really used to like to go on opie and jim because mm. you know, it was like i mean it's kind of weird like this whole thing started plus plus it was like 
like not to sh- not to shit on anyone, but like everybody shits on Opie. But I'm like the one thing I'll say about Opie. Opie loved the fucking you know like when you watch the Patrice documentary. Opie mm-hmm. loves fucking chaos. Like like yeah yeah. And and that's my take on it because you know Kumia likes Kumia's obviously great and everything, but he doesn't he doesn't like chaos like Opie likes chaos like mm-hmm. uh, and and Jim and Sam. I mean, they know they'll get. They can easily get fired because Opie and Kumia both got fired. Yeah. So, Opie was so they got to kind of take a shit, and he got. Fired. Yeah. Fired. So they got to be. They got to be careful. They. I guess they think we got to be careful. And the one sure way to get fired from uh, Sirius Satellite Sirius Satellite Radio is HR mm. calling you and going, "Yeah, you're fired." But I just think that. Um, I just think that like Opie Opie loves the the fucking chaos. So so. And he and and so when I my first couple of episodes like him and Jim I guess weren't even getting along then but like I didn't I didn't know that and I didn't sense it and so but whenever I did Opie and Jim my my Twitter would go nuts like mm. yeah. so so and you know Jim and Sam when I do it like it's fun and I like Sam I'm not just saying that but uh, like I like and I love Jim but it's like. But I just feel like um, I never think like, and maybe because just because I'm busy. But when I first, and plus when I first start, it's like when I first start doing Opie and Jim, mm. it was like when I first start doing stand up, like you get such a rush that you just want to do it constantly. You mm. know, like I would fucking basically harass Opie. Like Opie would tweet like, "Where's Sherrod?" Like Sherrod would not show up. <laughs> Yeah. And he would go, he would tweet, where's Sherrod? I would go, I'll show up. Like, I was like a bitch. I was like, I'll show up. I'll show <laughs> up one it. time. Well, so he, good news is I think you can get on there now. No, so it was, so, yeah, but it was like, it was like, so I, I, I think that's really what it comes down to. Like, I've got such a rush and my Twitter, like Twitter, I had no Twitter existence before that. Mm. And then, so I would get such a rush from like, I would get so, such a good reaction from being on the show that I just was like, let's do it more. Cause I knew it, the more I did it, the more, the, the better it would be for my career. And then, but then I got known there. So I guess the last couple of times I did Jim and Sam, it, I didn't get like much of a pop. People would complain that like, Oh, Brennan just complains and he's bitter. And I was like, fuck you. Then why should I even do it? You know, they all know me and they hate me. But, but I think I just, when I, you know, if I have something to promote, I'll definitely go on. Yeah. And like I said, I've been doing, uh, chip a lot lately so so i'm i'm sure norton has no beef with me and i don't think sam does either but but chad zumach likes to start trouble sometimes and yeah. says so are you banned and then i know it's kind of funny if i think I, if they if i act like i'm banned and then people be like oh is brennan banned yeah also <laughs> it has that reverse effect as well if you say that you're banned then jim and sam might you respond to that and say no he's not banned he can come on at any point and you might you might get yourself on <laughs> no of it. course like if i i know the easiest way to go is say i'm banned and yeah. then they'll be like you're not banned they'll have me on that week you know yeah uh the one thing about the matter east thing which is when he used to do those when he would be driving home from a gig and especially <laughs> the time when he was like he goes come on we got to do this together yeah. <laughs> it's a movie, i remember telling I remember telling my wife, I go, he's going to get into an accident. Yeah. And then, and then I was watching your video and you said the exact same thing. Like, I actually thought you were going to show him like getting to like a fender bender yeah. because you're to, to the detriment of his safety. He's, he keeps doing these, but I was, I would watch them cause I'm like, and I, and a, not a lot of people were watching them and I'm like, what is he doing? Like he, <laughs> he's hoping for, uh, he's Sebastian, his wife, he's like, yeah. he's got a family. Like, it, you can't, you can't like fucking, you can't say from your car, like, let's make this movement happen. I was like, <laughs> somebody, so when I saw you do that, I was like, I just, I was, I just couldn't, I don't know if I'd laugh, but I was like, that's exactly what I thought. I was like, it's not fucking dangerous. I mean, that's not safe. And it's also dumb. Like, yeah, you're not going to get fans by, by live streaming your drive home from a gig, you know? Yeah. And also if you, if you want to start a movement, of of you know fan like minded fans, I don't think that's the appropriate place or time really. But I mean, there's there's so much Joe Mattery <laughs> stuff that I haven't even. I was thinking about doing a part three at some point. You uh, gotta, you because, gotta, because there is just so much that I just keep looking at and thinking, what the hell is that? And and no, it's of, the gift that keeps on giving. Even his yeah. new stuff, even his new stuff. He the, the, the new Rocky podcast. podcast is insane. Absolutely yeah, he insane. looks like he. 
uh, Joe actually looks uncomfortable. Like for the first yeah. time, he actually look has a look in his eye. Like, I maybe I shouldn't be doing this. Like maybe mm. this is not a good look. And this and the other Rocky is so dull, and he's like. <laughs> I'm just, I'm like, I'm like, where does he fucking find these guys? And where does he think like, this is going to, this is going to be the fucking, this is going <laughs> to, this is going to support my movement. This is going to get my movement well, going thing, at warp speed. <laughs> the thing that prompted the second one was, um, I remember. Yeah, he the, asked you to, he asked you to make one and he was yeah, going to make money with you, right? It was that, yeah. It was, and again, he was driving and not looking at the road and instead right. staring at me, <laughs> t- looking at me and saying, oh, yeah. Saying yeah, let's let's do an, <laughs> another documentary, but you've got to put me in it this time. Yeah, um, and he, you know, I actually asked him if he'd be in it, and he just didn't answer. He didn't reply to me. So I guess really, yeah. After all that, he's he doesn't want to like he doesn't want to talk to me at, at all, which I kind of understand. You know, it's fair enough. Oh, but wow. but, but um, you reached out. You did reach out before you made the second one. Yeah, of course, I, I always do. But um, the funny thing is, wow. as well, uh, he. <laughs> Someone, someone sent a cat. You know the cameo, the the website where people yeah. pay it. Yeah. So yeah, someone did that, and it was my birthday at the time. So someone said, "Could you wish Porcelain a happy birthday?" And yeah, so I've got a cameo of him uh, wishing me happy birthday. But yeah, just the reason why I did that second one was, um, do you remember those like face swaps he would do with Sebastian Maniscalco, yeah. and Rocky yeah. and Tony Soprano and everything? Oh my just god! Just how deranged that was. It was, and it, I remember the Sebastian one especially. He would um he started filming um and I don't know why he kept this in the edit but you know as he's like doing his face he's trying to get his face right and he's doing his, he's doing like face poses and stuff and he's doing this for about two minutes straight just not saying a word just moving his face around and then he includes that in the video <laughs> he includes all that <laughs> stuff in the video so and then he starts his uh his Rocky thing or whatever it is the Sebastian stuff but yeah he's a very he's I can't get enough of him. He's he's just an absolute treasure. Um, and when did, what did he know when he did the cameo that he was talking to you? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. He did. Um, he was very sheepish about it, but he got paid to do it, so he kind of had to. <laughs> and he was like, uh, "I still don't know your name." He's like, "I still don't know your name. I don't know who you are." But uh, <laughs> he did it as he I'd love to know in... who you are. <laughs> he was like that. <laughs> he didn't do it as a character. No, no. I, I mean. I would. I, I. I don't know if I'd prefer that or not. Really, I. I think I'd rather have the real Joe. Um, I. I talked honest. to Florentine about it. Like not late. Not lately, but mm. you know, he was doing it. Uh, Matteris is doing a different podcast. He kept changing the name. He would get a, a producer. He would fire him or whatever. And I was <laughs> like, I, I said to Florentine, I go, what is he doing? I go, he's a. And then he puts out these clips of his comedy, and the comedy's good. So his stand-up comedy's good. So. I said to Florentine, I don't know him that well. And I said to Florentine, I go, what is he doing? Like he, <laughs> and Florentine goes, yeah. He goes, I don't know. He goes, he goes, I said, his stand up is good. He goes, Florentine goes, he was always a good comic. So I don't know why he keeps trying to, I'll do this. I'll, I'll make, do a podcast. I'll do, mm. like his Patreon has eight people. He has eight <laughs> people on his Patreon now for yeah. that stupid Rocky show. And it's like, Wait, you only did seven episodes and you're you're you have a Patreon already? It's like yeah. just stop, man. He's got more podcasts than patrons at the at the Yeah, time. he does. You I I know you're you're making a joke, but he literally if you counted them, he probably has in the last couple yeah. of years eight different variations of the fixing Joe. Who cares? I'm like, nobody cares. We're fixing not- a comic? Like what kind of meds you take? One episode I listened to, I said I used to listen to it to try to go to sleep, but mm. He he would he was talking to a comic and they were talking about what meds they were taking. It's like nobody gives a shit yeah. what kind of meds you're on. So you're not, I was, we're not invested in you as a person to to have this kind of discussion about right. medication. And it's not funny. It's just it's like no, no, right. nobody wants to hear people unless they're like old hmm. eighty year old people talking about what meds they take. Nobody wants to hear young people. Yeah. You know what if it's kind a of podcast Metron. of Charles Manson talking about his medications? I might be interested <laughs> in it, but this is Joe Murray. Yeah, 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 like like if they're on if they're on like death row. Yeah, let's let's hear that. <laughs> let's hear, hear what I want to hear the meds you're taking. Yeah, yeah. All right. But, um, no, it's weird. I think that also he uh, his big issue was I used to do this stupid podcast thing where I'd put I'd do an uh, sort of an impersonation of Joe, like doing a yeah I'm Joe like kind of thing. And I'd, I'd find audio of, like, Bill Burr or Lucy Kay or anything, and I'd splice up the audio so it made it sound like Joe was talking to them. And the podcast was just about, like, Joe's failings as a comedian. And he, <laughs> he, he didn't like that to the degree that he flagged every one of the videos for copyright 
of because I was because my impression of him was apparently copyright of him. <laughs> like wow. <laughs>